we're going to open up the meeting. Um, it's just our, uh, ourselves just at the start, but we'll be on record, so no heckling. And I'll begin as usual. Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 20th meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, I would ask everyone in the room, um, as I usually do, to turn off mobile phones as they can often, inter often interfere with the sound system. Although I ask people to know that I and, and others and, uh, uh, are using uh, tablet devices instead of hard copies of uh, papers. We have an apology uh, uh, from Rhoda Grant this morning. Uh, who's attending, I think, the Justice Committee and some other business. Uh, our first item on the agenda today is a decision to take consideration of our approach to health, tobacco, nicotine, etc. and care Scotland Bill, uh, the transplantation authorisation of removal of organs, etc. Scotland Bill, and its inquiry and, and our inquiry into palliative care in private at future meetings. So this is the our, uh, our approach to that. Are we, are we, are we, we happy with that? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, we now move to agenda item number two, which is subordinate legislation. We have four negative instruments before us today. The first instrument uh, before you is commu community care provision, residential accommodation out with Scotland. Uh, Sc Scotland regulations 2015, SSI 2015. 202. There has been no motion uh, to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have not made any comments to, uh, uh, on the instrument. Um, do members have any comment? No. We have no comment. Uh, is the com committee therefore agree to make no recommendation? Great. Thank you. Uh, the second instrument before us, um, Honey, Scotland, Regulations 2015. Um, uh, SSI 2015-208, there has been, uh, again, no motion uh, to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have made no uh, comments uh, to the instrument. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I invite comments from the committee. No, no comments. Has uh, the committee therefore agreed to take no, uh, make no recommendations? Sweet. Thank you. That's agreed. The third instrument and final instrument before us this morning is the National Health Service Optical uh, uh, Charges and Payments uh, General Ophthalmic Services Scotland Amendment Regulation 2015 SSI 2015-219. Again, there has been no motion to annul and the Delegated uh, Powers and Law Reform Committee have not made any comments on the instrument. Do any committee members have any comments? No comments. Uh, therefore, the, uh, I put the question that the committee has agreed to make no recommendations. Thank you. That is agreed. I'll suspend it at this point. Till we no, oh, no, but there is a fourth. I thought we had... No, there were five then, wasn't there? There were... I'm sorry, there was five uh, originally and then uh, four. But anyway, the fourth instrument is, and the very, very last instrument before us this morning, is the Public Bodies Joint Working Integration Joint Board Establishment Scotland Amendment Order 2015 SSI 2015-222. There has been uh, no motion to annul the delegated powers and... Uh, uh, the Law Reform Committee have not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, I invite comments from members. No, no comments. Does the committee therefore agree to make no recommendation? Sure. Thank you. That is, ag uh, that, that is agreed. Thank you. And uh, we now move to agenda item number three. And we'll just suspend for a moment to allow the panel to take their places. Thank you.
<coughs> now um, move to um, our third item on the agenda, which is a second evidence session uh, on um, National Health Service Board budget scrutiny. And last week, uh, you'll remember that we took evidence from the Director of Finance, uh, NHS Gla uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, NHS Ayrshire Narn, NHS Tayside, NHS Dumfries, and Galloway and NHS Western Wales. And, and today, we uh, would like to welcome Paul Gray, uh, Chief Executive, NHS Scotland, uh, and Director General Health and Social Care. Welcome. Uh, he's accompanied by uh, Dr. Uh, Kathleen uh, Calderwood, uh, Chief Medical Officer, uh, John Conaghan, uh, NHS Scotland Chief Operations Op Officer, and John Matheson, Director of Health, Finance, eHealth, Analytics, Scottish Government. Welcome to you all this morning. Um, I, I understand, uh, uh, Paul, do you want to make an opening, short opening statement? Yes, please, uh, you, you do that and then we'll move directly to questions. Thanks thank very much. Thank you very much. Well, I, I want to thank the committee uh, again for this opportunity to discuss the budgets. We've just concluded the financial year 2014-15 and subject to audit, we can report that boards have delivered services within financial plans for the seventh consecutive year. In doing so, delivery of efficiency savings has been a key part of maintaining financial balance and boards achieved savings of 284.9 million, which is 3.1% in 2014-15. We start from a strong base in NHS Scotland budgets. We plan for the long term and the short term, and we have clear financial planning assumptions. I wanted to assure the committee that budgets are not developed in isolation. They form part of boards' planning for service delivery and workforce, and our methods of funding are designed to provide equity as well as stability and to incentivise the right behaviours on efficiency and planning. Boards' plans for 2015-16 will deliver a balanced position. We recognise, however, that it is becoming increasingly challenging to do so, and that challenge will continue. That's why we have a strong focus on improvement and efficiency, and it's why we're continuing the very important work on the integration of health and social care. As always, convener, if there is information that the committee wishes to know and we don't have it immediately to hand, I will undertake to provide it as quickly as possible. And I'll also make good use of my colleagues who are with me who have expertise in particular areas in which the committee may have an interest. I'm grateful for the opportunity to make that brief statement. Thank you. Uh, we now go directly to Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm going to, to ask about the, the data that the government collects and garners from health boards and whether that's done in a, in a consistent and meaningful and comparable way. Now, I'm going to mention some information in relation to a hospital drugs anticipated price uplifts in, in relation to that and other uh, MSPs may wish to talk about that in terms of cost pressures in the NHS but that's not my reason for, for giving an illustration of the figure so for example if you look at hospital drugs anticipated price and volume changes 2015 to 2016 and I'll just um, give two boards um, for example so for example Ayrshire and Arne have got an assumed price uplift of 2% and an assumed volume uplift of 22% as reported to, to, to this committee. If you look at, uh, by comparison, uh, Dumfries and Galloway, they've got an assumed price uplift of 8.7%, but an assumed volume uplift of 2.5%. Now, they're just numbers, and in, in one respect, they're, they're meaningless, except for this. Um, when this committee does our budget scrutiny, and indeed when the Scottish Government takes a view on the local delivery plans of each health board, how can we be sure that these figures are being collected, collated and analysed in the same way? And just finally, in relation to that, I have no idea looking at these figures if they reflect, for example, the cost pressure mitigation of drugs going from uh, patent to generic. I have no idea if they take account of the £80 million new medicines fund that the Scottish Government has supplied. I've no idea if it's a horizon scanning of new drugs that are likely to be approved by SMC and then through to the ADTCs, I think it is. Um, I, 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 I don't know. 
but the government has to look at each health board across a variety of areas as part of the local delivery plan. So I apologise for starting off convener in relation to process, but this is very much a budget scrutiny process that this committee is involved in. So how do you ensure consistency and comparability to interrogate the figures of the local delivery plans from each health board? Thank you, Mr Doris. I'm, I'm going to signal to my colleague John Matheson that I'll bring him in on this shortly, and Dr Calder would we also want to comment on any clinical aspects. Uh, and I'll, I'll focus on the question you've asked, although I realise it has broader applicability in other areas where there may be uh, comparable or not comparable figures. First of all, um, boards will make an assessment based on their own local demography. So, in other words, the, the patients that they expect to treat uh, and the age of the population uh, would be two factors. Um, uh, so, for example, we know that certain drugs, if I use Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which is not one of the examples you've advanced, but certain drugs are, are used more frequently and at higher cost in Greater Glasgow and Clyde because of the type of patients that they uh, have within the board area. So it is, not, it is not therefore a concern to us if different boards make a different assessment. However, you're pointing to quite sharp variation in, in the assessment here, um, both in terms of the likely uh, cost pressures and the likely numbers. Um, and we do look at the budgets across the piece to uh, assure ourselves that uh, boards have made rational assumptions. But, but that said, we don't seek to second guess the boards and the clinical advice that they will have had uh, from their own uh, medical director and from the clinical governance uh, 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 and assurance processes that they have in place. But John Matheson may want to say more about this. And then, as I say, Dr Calder would, may come in too. Thank you, Mr Gray. Mr. Doris, you're, you're, you're right to highlight drugs and, and uh, to specifically pick on drugs. After staffing, drugs is our next highest spend area. It's £1.4 billion. What we do with boards generically is we have a collegiate approach across boards. We, we discuss planning assumptions as uh, we move forward into not just the next financial year, but future financial years. And we do that through the, the corporate finance group. So we look at pay assumptions, we look at inflationary assumptions, we look at uh, the impact of pension increases, national insurance increases. Specifically on this, Mr Gray is right to the extent that the, the, there will be a differential approach. It depends on how efficient boards have been at the moment. You're, you, you picked up specifically on branded to genetic and where they are positioned on that. So we would expect variation across boards. With regard to your specific detail, we would expect boards to be including within this the, 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 the New Medicines Fund pressure, hepatitis C is another positive example where there is a differential approach across boards. There's a high prevalence of hepatitis C users, hepatitis C A patients within Greater Glasgow and Clyde. They are 25% of the population, but they have about 40% of the hepatitis C patients. So the new drug that's been, been brought out recently, which actually cures hepatitis C patients, has a significant impact on Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So we would expect a differential position. The, the, the split between price and volume, I'm more concerned in terms of the total trend in terms of expenditure. And I'm also concerned in how proactive boards are in looking at further efficiencies within that £1.4 billion. So, for example, we are being proactive around the introduction of the Scottish Therapeutics Utility tool which is made available to GPs to review repeat prescriptions and is focused on reducing harm, reducing variation, but it will also have financial savings. So there's a complex matrix here. The, the differential is a, not a surprise to me. The, the key for me is the robustness of the estimates and throughout the year we will then go back and review how accurate those estimates have been with boards. Dr. Caldwell, were you going to? Sorry. Just to say that we, um, another example might be that 60% of cancer patients are treated by the Beetson Hospital in, in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And as you know, that as a subset of drugs, the chemotherapy drugs are, are some of the most individual expensive drugs. So again, it's, it's the population that 
that is needing those expensive treatments. There are also very expensive immunomodulator drugs, which one or two individuals may be on within a certain health board. We wouldn't know the clinical details of that, but that might actually be enough to push up an individual budget quite a lot. Okay. Now, um, I thank the witnesses for the clarity in terms of understandable variations in relation to drug costs. Um, and and, and I, do, I do get that. Um, so, for example, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, we know, because this committee visited uh, the new robotic centre in the south of Glasgow and the, and the, the, the health board's uh, ability to deal with polypharmacy and, and, and efficiencies in the system. So we get that there can be variations based on performance and best practice. But that was only half my question. The other half of my question, which I don't think was addressed by the witnesses, uh, was over a matrix or a framework by which each of the NHS boards report to the Scottish Government in a consistent and comparable manner uh, 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 and, and methodology around that. So, is there, for lack of a better expression, is there scaffolding around the, the returns they have to give, a framework around the returns they have to give to the Scottish Government? Because what we have is numbers here, we've got variations. I take on board absolutely all the reasons for those variations, but what we don't have is actually an explanation as to whether how the boards collect these figures is done in a consistent or comparable way. And that's what I think we need to know. And if it's never been done, I, 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 and it's, it's not a matter of blame. What I want to do is get to a position where it is done. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's a broader question about making comparisons. And every time we make a comparison, we get a long explanation about, uh, uh, about why there is a variation in Glasgow or a rural... It's a consistency of the information that's been put before us and how it's collected uh, and, and whether those boards uh, actually use the same methodology at, to, to collect that information or whether some, in some cases they don't collect it at all. Yeah. Okay, no, that, that's entirely understood, uh, Convener, and John Matheson will give you, um, uh, understand, uh, help, help us to understand how we collect the information and the consistency of the framework, both of which are, are, do apply. Convener, I will make this very succinct. We have the, the, the corporate finance network, which is the senior directors of finance, deputy directors of finance, who come together and they review the planning assumptions going forward. So they, they, they look at consistency of approach across pay and prices. We then get the individual returns coming in from boards and we will then respond, if you take Ayrshire and Arden as an example, we will say to them, well, the average across Scotland for uh, drug inflation and, and the volume increases is X. You look as if you're an outlier. Can you review your position? They will review their position and either change it or confirm that there are specific reasons why they are an outlier. So there is a basic framework in place through the corporate finance network, which uh, brings the, the planning assumptions together proactively for the next year and the next uh, two or three years after that. And then there's a review mechanism built into that whereby the returns are then played back to the boards to allow them to either confirm that their assumptions are still extant or may moderate their assumptions. Just finally, because I'm going to come off process and allow uh, my colleagues to come and ask different questions, but it is kind of important. I'm partially reassured that there's that kind of corporate finance director framework, whatever that is, and that dialogue between the finance experts in each of the health boards and the Scottish Government and outliers, and I get all that and understand all that, but it's the reported figures that, that we get. Are you saying that they are collected in the same way, they do have the same framework, and therefore we can directly compare? So, for example, when Ayrshire and Arden say there's a 2% assumed price uplift and Borders say there's a 13.6% assumed cost uplift, we can go, aha, that's because of demography. It's not because Ayrshire and Arden have taken into account generics and Borders hasn't, or Ayrshire and Arden uh, have done a better horizon scanning exercise with future cross pressures than Borders has. In other words, are the numbers collected in a consistent way, other than just waiting to see how they're collected and then asking the outliers to explain themselves? I won't come back for a follow-up on this, because I want to come off of process. But it is quite important, and it's not just, I've picked drugs because that's the information I've got in front of me. It could be any part of the NHS. It's telling us effective 
budget scrutiny, because I'm getting maybe there's good budget scrutiny between the government and the health boards, but there, it's a three-legged stool, this. there's this committee as well, and we want to be part of that process. I absolutely recognise the, the, the critical role of this committee. The, the aim here is that the core planning assumptions, which would include those factors that you're identifying, Mr Doris, if we focus specifically on drugs, are included within the planning assumptions of the boards, so that any differentiation is a differentiation in terms of the impact of those core planning assumptions and not the absence of them. OK, I think I'll reflect on that rather than ask a follow-up question, convener. Yes, Mr Gray. Would it be helpful, convener, if we uh, set out for the committee in writing the basis on which the financial plans are constructed, the basis on which they're scrutinised, and the basis on which they're then reviewed at the end of the year? Would that would the committee find that helpful? Because we'd be we'd be very I'm sure happy we would. Because uh, we, we, you know the following questions, I think, will say, well, you, you've got that. How, yeah. do, how then? How important is the, the information that you are gathering? And how important is to push forward your strategic plan? How do you build in risk to that, like politicians complaining about access to those very expensive uh, end-of-life drugs and cancer drugs, which the, 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 the boards of, of our health boards were squealing about? Uh, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you get politicians, how do you build in that risk of politicians announcing an £80 million pound Fund for rare diseases, and uh, uh, you know, and 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 uh, you know, in the in the newspapers. So, how, how do you build that at risk into all of uh, all of this uh, strategic planning and financial planning? Just to uh, make an additional offer to, to Mr. Gray's offer, I'd be happy to take a couple of boards where there seems to be a, a sort of differential outcome, and just explain for the committee why that differential outcome has uh, has occurred. If that would be helpful. In, yes. terms of, in terms of the, the £80 million pounds, a new medicines fund, the boards will be looking at their individual cost profile against that. So we will have from the SMC a horizon scan in terms of a, what drugs are coming down the pipeline over the next financial year. We will have the impact of individual patient treatment requests, the impact of ultra-orphan ultra -orphan drugs. And as Dr Calderwood pointed out, because they are a low volume, high cost, there is very much a, 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 a different profile across Scotland. So ecolizumab for a, a cystic fibrosis has a very, a, a, a very small number of patients across Scotland, but the cost of the drug is several hundred thousand pounds. But it may, it may, be, it may be useful if you, if, 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 if you compare reality and the pressures that run the system as against those, uh, those budget plans, because, you know, since I was on the health committee, and it goes back, you know, a number of years now, we've been talking about controlling the price of prescribed drugs, and, and we're, we're still at it. And we have estimated that we, you know, uh, uh, drugs going off patient would generate, uh, you know, X amount of, of money, and that would reduce the drugs bill and whatever. It hasn't happened <laughs> to, to to the significant extent that we expected to, to happen because there's. But we're, we're focusing a bit too much on drug, drugs here. I think uh, uh, maybe we'll get a wee bit more coherent as we, we, we move in. We're, we're trying to see where the, the budget planning actually is pushing along the priorities and the, and the long-term strategies of government about delivering you know, care more away from the clinical settings and in the community settings. And that's what we're... Uh, we're and we're hearing about all of these pressures that affect the budget and, and obviously some of the, 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 the priorities. We're just trying to get at the heart of that. Yes? Let me just make one, one point. We're focusing yes. quite rightly here on the cost of drugs, but our focus in terms of how we look at how drugs are utilised is say, as focused and not more focused on the variation and patient harm, etc., to try and ensure that we've got that clinical focus in terms of how we review the drug expenditure. <coughs> yeah, I mean, it could, it could be drugs, it could be workforce planning. Indeed. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we count the, the, the well, we assess the health of the health service and the, the basis of how many doctors and many, and many nurses we've got an old-fashioned idea now, but anyway, we still do it. And we spend inordinate amounts of money, uh, you know, uh, uh, recruiting people 
out with the recruitment plan and out, out with the budget plan. That, you know, we're, we're, that's what we're trying. To, that's what we're struggling with here as a committee, I suppose. Um, who have I got? Richard Simpson. Yes, can I begin by congratulating John Matheson on his honour yeah, after Richard. Richard. Much deserved. But I want to, to focus on the, um, the question of the uh, incremental cost of achieving targets. And because there's no doubt, and I think the whole committee would agree, that targets have served, uh, served us extremely well since, since the Parliament was formed. It has driven forward performance in a way which previously had simply not been possible. But uh, it was cl quite clear from both an FOI that I did and the evidence last week that we have some problems. Uh, the, first of all, the FOI which I did, uh, the, the overwhelming majority of finance directors could not tell me the incremental cost of, of, the, of achieving targets, that final group of pushing them through. And last week we heard, uh, I think it was from Derek Lapsley at uh, Air Shonan, an example of the waiting list initiative where they were having to pay the consultant three times the normal rate in order to get them to actually undertake a waiting list initiative. And I think all the finance directors agreed last week that the cost of achieving that final element in the target, particularly when it is a 100% and it is a legal target, is just a huge cost to the health service that is actually not spending money wisely. So could I ask you whether you think this committee, as a collective, nothing to do with party, but whether we should be joining the RCN's call this week to say that we need to look at whether we modify these targets in a position of austerity which we're in to actually spend our money more wisely. So what are the costs? Do you ask, ask for the costs? Uh, and is it money spent wisely? So, Dr Simpson, you're right to say that it is hard to determine the incremental cost of meeting the last 1% or 2% of, en of any particular target. We could, that, that would apply to um, <clears throat> the treatment time guarantee and uh, doubtless to other targets too. The uh, position of uh, someone being paid three times the, the, av the, the standard rate is the position... Uh, in, in terms of asking someone to work at a weekend, and that is the rate that applies. So if there is um, a, a waiting times or other uh, high-profile um, target that is being addressed through an initiative, then some of these costs will certainly be incurred, and it's possible to calculate what these are. But the, uh, the overall cost of meeting the last percentage points of a target is not something that we routinely collect. You're asking me whether um, I think that this committee should join with the RCN uh, and others in, in, in seeking a review, particularly, I think, of the treatment time guarantee. Um, it would be for the committee to decide its own position on that, I would say. Um, what I will say is that as uh, uh, the Chief Executive of the National Health Service, I must and will remain committed to meeting the treatment time guarantee for as long as it is a legislative requirement. I can't do otherwise. But if the committee, on the basis of the evidence before it, felt that it ought to press for a change in the legislation, then that would be a matter for the committee. I think it is fair to say um, that the last percentage points of this target do cost money to meet. And I think it is also fair to say that some clinicians have questioned with me whether at, the, at that far end of the target uh, it, it's absolutely clinically necessary to meet it in every single case. But these points having been made, I must nonetheless proceed on the basis of the legislation. I can't do otherwise. Just, it goes back Can to the original, you know, our first five minutes of going round, round houses, but... It's the data collection. I mean, we don't, uh, this committee can't make a recommendation unless we understand what's involved. And until we actually get some idea, some modelling, which I'm really surprised is not being done, of the incremental cost at the far end of meeting, or not meeting in the case of 10,000 Scots who didn't get the guarantee, the legal guarantee last year, I mean, you know, we're not even reaching it. 
I know the fractions are small. I mean, we're, we're 99% there, which is fantastic. I mean, it's a great achievement. But, you know, to force the system to achieve that final 1% and indeed not achieve it is costing us a fortune, which could much better be spent in other areas, I think. But unless you in the centre uh, can supply the data, get the boards to model, there's no way we can make recommendations on this. Thank you, Dr Simpson. So I'm happy to take from the committee uh, a request that we seek to do, first of all, to establish what we do have available. Finance directors have said that the information is limited, but let us establish what we do have. And then I will also uh, consider with ministers, uh, because ultimately it will be a decision for them, what more we might do to collect information about the incremental costs of meeting the last percentage points of the target. I'm happy to take that away uh, from you. So when, when we decided to improve the waiting time targets, did the people that was doing the budgets not say, well, this will, that's a great idea, Minister, but this is what it will cost? Or did, or did, or did, did, that not affect, did that not affect this budget process at all? We just said, oh, that's fine. But there was no information about costs and outcome at the heart of that decision to, 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 to go further in waiting times. Is, is, is that what we're hearing today? What I'm, what I'm saying is I, I can't speak for the advice that was given to ministers at the time, and, of course, advice to ministers is, as the com committee knows, in private. But um, the decision was made uh, through a parliamentary process. The, the legislation was scrutinised in the normal way. Um, there would no doubt be uh, the, the normal costing information associated with that. But what we were not asked to do once the le legislation was implemented was to collect information on the incremental cost of meeting the last few percentage points. And therefore, we do not have a system in place that routinely does that. The committee, as I take it, is saying to me today that they would be interested to have information on that. I will... Uh, raise that point with ministers and we'll come back to the committee uh, quickly on, on that point. Bob Doris, you want to take a Very, very brief supplementary because I've already had an opportunity, convener, but very specifically on uh, Dr Simpson's point about 100% treatment time guarantee. Whether it was 100 or 95 or 90, as soon as you set a target and there's a number, you're always just going to be half a percent or 1% or 2% away from meeting that target. So if targets are reduced be it from 100% or 95% or 90%, is the principle not just the same? To meet that target in absolute terms requires additional cost. So it's not that the target sits at 100%. It's as soon as you put in a target, when you're just short of that target, is one final heave to get over the finishing line to meet it. Would that be a reasonable thing to say? So we shouldn't just focus on the treatment time guarantee. We should look at that additional money and cost to get over any target, and then it's of course for the politician to decide which targets we believe are most important. Can we broaden that, Bob? Because it wasn't just the money we were hearing. We were hearing that these targets were driving the priorities more than the planning frameworks or whatever, whatever they were. So, so it's not just about money. It's about how we, how they are diverting us from some of our other strategic objectives and policy. It's, it's, it's that, that's, I think, what we heard la last week. Uh, I'll bring Mr yes. Conachan in, in a second, convener, if I may, but, um, and the, the Chief Medical Officer may have a comment on the clinical aspects of this, but let, let me try to, to cut this up into three parts, if I may. Yes, that would be first, first of all, the, there is a difference. Uh, uh, there is a difference between a 100% target and say a 95% target such as we have in accident and emergency. What we're saying in accident and emergency is that it will not always be clinically appropriate to have someone seen, treated and discharged from A&E within four hours. Most of the time it will. In 95% of cases, the, the clinical advice is it is appropriate to do that. But for example, uh, within the past few days, a person in one of the A and E uh, emergency departments in Glasgow was there for well over four hours. Throughout that four hours, they were receiving appropriate treatment and care, and they were too unwell and unstable to be moved. It would have been wholly inappropriate 
to take them out of A&E within that four-hour period. So um, that's the first point, a 95% target with some, some flexibility for clinical judgment is different from a 100% target. Second point, therefore, um, the, the cost of meeting a 95% target will be some, driven somewhat differently from the cost of meeting a 100% target. There is a degree of flexibility for cl clinical decision making in the A&E target which is not present in the treatment time guarantee. Um, thirdly, um, I, I'm slightly hesitant to say that uh, targets are one thing and priorities are another. I mean, it is a priority to see and treat and discharge people from A&E within four hours. That, that's a priority as well as a target, as well as, well, we now call it a standard. So it, 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 to say that, that these are deflecting us from priorities, um, I, I wouldn't like to go that far. However, I take the point that the committee is making that if the expenditure to reach the last fraction of a target is proportionately excessive and doesn't deliver clinical benefit, then that may be something we should look at. Okay. You, you, yes, Mr. Corr. Um, I think it's probably worthwhile just remembering where we were back in 2005-06. Um, uh, at that point, uh, the NHS had what we called a performance assessment framework. There were over 200 plus individual targets. Boards at that point were complaining, look, what is the priority here? We need some degree of um, focus in terms of what we're doing. And out of that came the then HEAT system, which was established in 2006-07. Now, as of today and, and listening to the advice that we've taken from this committee and indeed um, through consultation, we now have 20 standards in the NHS, which I, I do agree with the committee. These do drive investment. In, in certain respects. Um, and it's worthwhile, I think, maybe just saying that these come into seven broad categories. Um, so you can subdivide the 20 into seven broad categories. These are cancer standards, mental health standards, waiting times, infection, finance and governance, emergency services, and broadly some standards around health improvement. So those, those are things which I think are really all all important for both the health of the population and indeed the efficiency of how we pursue the deployment of our, of our budget. And um, when, a, when we engage with um, bodies, for instance, like the um, College of Emergency uh, Medicine on what is appropriate, they invariably come back and say, look, our particular standard, um, which is the four hour A&D standard, is one that we really don't want to shift or move away from. It's important. So we do take advice on these, but I, I do think it's a moot point about the incremental cost. I have some sympathy with uh, Mr. Doris's point that if you were to make, let's say, 12 weeks, 15 weeks, then there's an incremental cost in reaching the 15th week, if I can put it like that. So, uh, but I do think the tighter you do draw a particular standard, there is an argument about um, incremental cost. And um, I think we, we, we've heard from the Director General that we will uh, supply some information on that. Thanks. Dr. Colder, would you wish to add anything at this point? Um, I suppose just to say that we, if we stick with the 4 RA and e waiting time target, that, I mean, that's a process measure. It, it doesn't tell you how, how good you are at the end of that time. But what we do know is it's based on evidence that the longer you spend in A&E, the poorer your outcome and the more potential harm that occurs. So these are proxy measures which actually are driving clinical improvements. We, we have outcome measures and the cancer standards would be more um, along those lines where we know a percentage of patients who serve a five-year survival, for example. But what we really struggle with, and uh, th these targets are our proxies for our quality of care measures, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to measure quality of care. If, um, because, and of course, not everyone will have a good outcome, but what we want them to have through our NHS is a good quality of care, even if the outcome is, is, is something we cannot prevent um, a, a poor outcome. So I, I think that what we need to do is to, is to make sure that we understand that these treatment time guarantees or the four-hour waiting time is actually based on good, sound clinical advice. So it sounds like just a number, but in fact, there, there is, they've always been developed with patient care and patient outcomes behind them. I think that with this 
um, raising recently of the RCN of, of looking at these targets. We know that this is a, an evolving process. We've changed over time, as Mr Conaghan has said, and I think that we would always be willing to, to revise targets, to revise standards, uh, because partly because the way we work in medicine changes. I think that actually that engagement has has been quite quite important to make the point that there has been progress, but uh, and recognise that presently there are a number of targets. And there's also heat targets, a performance target, whatever. There seems an awful lot, but in comparison to what we had. You know, there's been a, a, a reduction there. And there's also, we picked up last week about this, gathering information that doesn't really tell us very much. Like, um, how many people died in ho uh, hospital is against the community. And then boasting about it, oh, well, more people are dying at home than whatever, with no reference at all to the quality uh, uh, of, of that care or... Or engagement. So, I, I th I th hopefully, you see where the, 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 the committee is going with some of this. Can there be more clarity? Do we need no, more clarity? Do we need more focus? And certainly, the, the good point was made by Dr. Calder with how do we measure quality and the impact on patients and all of this. But I think I'll, I'll let you back in, Richard, because there's some of the other head, headings there that you might want to speak to. Uh, but Richard Lyle wants. Right. Th can I come in on this fact that you know, a number of years ago I actually wore glasses, I had cataracts, I went and got cataract operations both eyes on two weekends and you, I think at that time you halved the number of people waiting for uh, cataract operations. With the greatest respect I have to ask this question because it's a question that's always annoyed me. Does it annoy you when politicians from whatever party interfere in the NHS by turning around and saying, change that target, put that target up, put that target down. How much does that annoy you? Well, yes, I think I'll answer for all of us <laughs> in the interests of diplomacy. <coughs> um, Mr Lyle, I would, if, if, if it was my stock in trade to be annoyed by politicians, I would not be a civil servant. <laughs> politicians are elected, and I respect that. I respect the democratic right of the people of Scotland to elect the politicians of their choice, and I, expect, I, I respect the right of the politicians to decide. We are here to advise. Politicians are here to decide. And I'm perfectly happy with that. And if I allowed my personal views or what might annoy me to enter into uh, my judgments about what I did, then I don't think I would be doing my job professionally. So actually, I welcome the challenge and scrutiny of committees like this, and I welcome the challenge that politicians of all parties provide, because generally speaking, every politician I have met has a motivation to make things better. They may have different views about how it should be done, but I respect the right of the politicians to take the positions that they take, and I'll work with that. <laughs> Answer, but uh, have you got a further question, uh, uh, Richard? Have you have a further question? What me? Yes. Uh, no, ba no, basically along that along that that line. At the end of the day, yes, we have targets, but should we not ask politicians, every party, sit down? and agree where we are going with our health service. It annoys me intensely, I have to say it again, that the NHS becomes a political football that every party takes a swipe at. And we are all uh, in that game. And basically what I'm saying to you is, if, based on the points that uh, Richard Simpson has made quite correctly, should we sit down and give you clear direction that every party signs up to it. And once they've signed up to it, we stop throwing bombs at the NHS. Well, <clears throat> certainly the more consensual the decisions about the NHS, the better, as far as I'm concerned. It, uh, I wouldn't deny the fact that it makes my life easier if there is agreement about what the um, propositions and the solutions and the outcomes should be. That said, I would not at any time want to stifle healthy debate about the future direction of the National Health Service. It is a complex, 
multifaceted system. It, it, it does not operate in a vacuum. It operates in the context of all the other public services that are provided. It operates in the context of the demographic trends that we face. It operates in the context of health and social care integration. I think to suggest that there will ever be one simple solution to the uh, problems we face would be naive of me. So I wouldn't want to stifle debate about the options that are ahead of us. But I can, at the end of that, a consensus will certainly make um, it easier to implement. Okay. Dennis Robertson. Thank you very much, convener, and uh, good morning. Uh, I wonder if we could just widen the scope a little um, uh, and sort of look at the how you evaluate and how you account for the preventative care aspect. And when you're looking at, uh, and Mr Gray uh, and your colleagues have mentioned improvement several times, does improvement equal efficiency? And does efficiency still look after patient care? And if we're looking at this broad aspect of um, prevent prevention, because that's, I think at the end of the day, we would like to prevent people going into hospital and looking at other uh, uh, integrated services, perhaps. How do you manage to account for that? Because is it not the variables across all the boards must be, and you said, Mr. Gray, complex and multifaceted? So, thank you, Mr. Robertson. Um, well, let me start by saying that evaluating the um, the efficiencies or savings delivered from preventative interventions is is quite hard because you're making a judgment about what didn't happen as a result of the intervention you made. <coughs> Nevertheless, there is evidence a, a, across a range of preventative spend that early intervention is more cost effective. So, for example, the Early Years Collaborative, the Raising Attainment Collaborative, you could argue that these are preventative measures. These are uh, helping people to intervene uh, early in the life cycle of a child, to intervene with the child and with their families, to intervene in ways that are co-produced, that are not superimposed. And there is clear evidence that by doing that, then the life chances of children are improved. Can I then say explicitly that that means there will be so many fewer visits to hospital, so many fewer interactions with the criminal justice system, a better educational outcome for every child? I cannot say on an absolute basis, but what I can say is that the evidence suggests that early intervention in these circumstances means that the life chances of children as a whole are improved, and therefore that's something that we want to have. One example, perhaps in a, in, in a narrower health setting, the hospital at home service, which I've seen in many places, I'll, I'll pick on Lanarkshire as my example for today, um, that prevents elderly people from going into hospital. And I have spoken both to patients and to families who have benefited from that. Now, the outcome for the individuals is definitely better. You asked about whether these were all about you know, imp improvements for efficiency and what did we think about the outcome. There is no doubt at all in my mind that the outcome for the individuals was better, even to the simple extent of a lady being able to give an account to me of spending Christmas at home with her family instead of spending it in a hospital yep. bed. And understand all all those points, Mr. Gray, I absolutely understand all those points. The thing I'm trying to um, a, a probably ascertain is how do you account for that from the sort of budget perspective? How, how, how do your directors of finance actually model that in to the framework? Um, and how do they do that across all the boards? Okay, That's, so I'm, yeah. thank you, Mr. Robson. I'm going to bring Mr. Corrick and then Mr. Matheson in on yep. this. What I will say is that um, I, I'll stick with my example of hospital at home. It can be applied more widely. Um, I, I have asked that further data be collected on uh, not just the outcomes, although they are really what we're striving to achieve, but also the relative costs. Because what we do know is that we are reducing the pressure on accident and emergency. We are reducing the pressure on unplanned admissions to hospitals. But we also know that we're paying a cost of having um, 
in this case, a, uh, a senior uh, consultant, geriatrician, and a number of other uh, clinicians working alongside that individual in Lanarkshire. So that cost has moved out of the hospital into the community. And what, what we're not yet absolutely clear about is whether the net cost is the same or lower. We don't believe it's higher, but we're not quite clear if, yet if it's lower. I'm, I'm just being honest with you about that. But I'll ask Mr Conachan and then Mr Matheson to add something. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> For the past few years, we have um, uh, taken the opportunity to publish a number of case studies where uh, efficiency and productivity gains have been realised while also benef benefiting patient care. And I think you asked a direct question about how do we account for these things. Um, uh, this annual report, which is um, uh, in fact the 2014 um, calendar year annual report, is just about to be published um, uh, shortly. It has about 50 case studies. Most of these have got quantification in them. Uh, and if I pick an example, um, this is a, a small example. There's a, a, a board case study in here from <coughs> NHS Lothian about how to promote quality and cost effectiveness in use of wind dressings. Uh, and, and this isn't just um, Lothian blowing its own trumpet. It's um, uh, a series of examples that are applicable to most boards, and we encourage um, most boards to adopt these good principles. And there are other examples. Uh, but uh, we, we've been doing this now for about four or five years in terms of publishing that annual report. Mr Robertson, just one generic point and then two or three specific examples. So the, the, the overall strategy that we have within NHS Scotland is the quality strategy and the thrust of the quality strategy is safe, person-centred, effective care and people being treated at home or in a homely setting. And our sub-strategies all point in that direction in terms of supporting that. I mentioned earlier prescription for excellence. So prescription for excellence from a preventative perspective is looking at how we get a strengthened engagement with community pharmacists, how we reduce the number of uh, unnecessary admissions that are due to medication errors, where the, the, the figure at the moment, Dr Calder can correct me, is I think around about one in seven of hospital admissions is caused by that. So a more proactive engagement with community pharmacists, a reduction in harm there. Within our overall financial strategy, then, we do identify specific sums of money to actually take forward that preventative agenda. So we have a very specific investment in telehealth, telecare, looking at home monitoring, looking at that more uh, the use of technology to, to delay admissions. Another example is within the Scottish Ambulance Service, where we've just invested a sum of money as part of an ongoing programme to upskill paramedical technicians to allow them to uh, assess people in their homes and rather than take them in to A&E to stabilise in their homes. And that then needs a strength of community engagement in terms of community nursing, social care, etc., to enable these people to be kept in their homes. So these are two specific examples in the context of our strategic direction. Community optometry, for instance, people have regular eye tests. It's, it prevents maybe trips and falls, I mean, that, that sort of thing. But, but it's pretty subjective, isn't it? And what I'm saying is, how do you account, how, what, what numbers do you assign to it in terms of money? Because it, the, the, the finance directors have got to come up with some cost costings in their budget for, for this strategy. So the definition between specific investment, appropriate investment, sufficient investment to drive yeah. more people uh, being treated. There were no targets to ensure that X amount of people will be cared for in the community at home or close to home. But we have, if, if, if you know, you've got polyps or something, or you know, you're, that you can get through the system. So, you know, I suppose what we see is the absence of a number of features that we would take for granted within the NHS setting, which would be prioritisation, uh, quality of outcome for the patient, you know, uh, guidelines and standards, all applying, targets to drive that activity, budgets to support it. Where is the equivalent uh, w w within the community and the integrated boards? Are we, are we investing enough there to change that, the, 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 and drive that change over a, a, a period of time? Right. Sorry, Sorry. Can I come in on the integrated yeah, no, joint no, boards, no. Convener. There are, the, so the outcomes for the integrated joint boards are set in legislation. 
So, I mean, they're, they're, they're clear. And the budgets for the integrated joint boards are subject to scrutiny. And this is the shadow year. Um, and if uh, there, there is, uh, to go back to the point that Mr Doris made early on, there is variation in the budgets of the INGVs, and no, which is not all explicable by the demography and geography of the IGBs, but it is also explicable by the fact that there are certain things that they must include in their integration scheme and certain things that they may include in their integration scheme. So that different integrated joint boards will have decided to include different things. Um, I, I, I realise that what I'm doing at the moment, convener, is describing to you the things that always make comparison harder, and you're asking me how can we make comparison easier? And th there, isn't a st there isn't a straightforward answer to that because different factors apply in each board and in each integrated joint board. However, each board is operating to the same financial standards. Each board is operating, each territorial board is operating to the same performance standards. Each integrated joint board is operating to the same set of outcomes set in legislation. To, so to that extent, there is commonality. The question you're asking, and it's a legitimate one, is how do I assure myself as the accountable officer for all of this that the different portions of money, the different budgets that are set in different places are all going to add up to the outcomes for the people of Scotland that we want to see? The answer is I do it through a series of assurance processes that already exist. I have, I have to accept some of the assurances I get on uh, clinical and financial matters from the people who are expert in these matters. Um, but nevertheless, I, do, I am able to look down a series of assurance and governance mechanisms that help me to draw this together into a single picture. And I am confident that what we have in place is at the moment providing me with sufficient assurance, I'm equally confident that it could be better. So there are, there are areas in which we could improve. And in the year of the shadow integrated joint boards, we will look to review and analyse the propositions that the integrated joint boards have put forward and to learn from these so that when we come to the first um, full year of operation in 2016-17, we will not simply walk into it as though this year had not happened. Dr Calderwood had a specific example on, on maternity services, which I think may be of, may be of assistance to the committee. Um, I, I'm delighted, Mr Robertson, that you've asked a question about preventative spend, because uh, as um, you may know, I'm an obstetrician, and so I'm always telling um, my colleagues that if you only um, invested in the pregnant woman, you would have a healthier baby who would grow into a healthier child and adult, and in fact, I could solve the costs of the um, NHS in the future. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, but, but in fact, I, I think you're, you're so, so if we take, and you're, I'm sure this committee is familiar with quality adjusted life years, so how much do you need to spend in order to have a, a, a long, one more year of quality life? And if you take prevention of preterm delivery, that is the ultimate, because for these babies, if they live long, healthy lives, of course, live very long lives. And in fact, the prevention of preterm delivery only costs £300 per quality, as opposed to something that we would, um, up to £10,000 would be, would be deemed value for money. The, 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 the investment, though, is, is difficult because it's multifactorial. So Scottish Government has invested in a, a maternity collaborative, a maternity safety collaborative, which involves reducing all sorts of harmful um, it, uh, problems in pregnancy, such as smoking, which would in turn prevent preterm delivery. But there are the, the difficulty of measuring that is that if we also reduce all sorts of other issues, we may also have other um, knock-on effects in, onto preterm delivery. So the boards have invested a million pounds um, across Scotland in some maternity champions who are looking at tackling all of these um, outcomes for um, pregnant women. But I suppose to, to then go back to them and say, well, how much did you save is very difficult to actually quantify that. So what we can see already is very impressive reduction in stillbirth rate. We know that the, the smoking ban across Scotland generally has reduced our preterm delivery rate. But actually being able to say we spent X and gained Y 
it is extremely difficult. I would, however, commend you on continuing to ask that question. Thank you. Uh, I'm just trying to get the efficiency. Every board is asked to have an efficiency spend um, or, or reduction, I suppose, uh, across all the boards. And what I suppose concerns me is how you prioritise and what falls off the end, what, what's not happening maybe to, to attain those efficiencies. Are we not delivering a particular aspect of care to a patient for that um, outcomes that we look for? Because when you're asked to prioritise, does something have to give? And if it does, uh, where is it? Is it around the preventative spend? Is it with the joint uh, integrated boards? You know, I'm just trying to work out in terms of the spending, because we have finite resources, everybody has their own budget, um, but you're asked to have that efficiency. So if you have the efficiency, and every board has one, how do we prioritise it? I'll ask Mr yeah. Matheson and Mr Corrigan to come in, but I will share with you, Mr Robertson, an area uh, where I am uh, currently... Um, taking some steps to see if we can improve. I am concerned that in the pursuit of efficiency and delivery, we are underplaying our hand on developing leadership capacity within our workforce. Now, what do I mean by that? <laughs> well, it would, you see. Um, because it's, leadership capacity is one of the in my view, one of the keystones of prevention. It prevents things from going wrong. So we've had a very helpful and robust conversation, for example, with the Academy of Royal Colleges in Scotland. And that has in part been about the extent to which uh, consultant contracts allow sufficient time for consultants to develop themselves and their leadership capacity. And while I have not sought to impose a particular solution on boards, what I have said to boards, and I've said it in writing, is that I expect them to be flexible in setting up and then reviewing consultant contracts, because I attach great importance to senior colleagues, whether they're clinicians or administrators or whatever they are within the NHS, having the time and space to develop and exercise proper leadership. Because if they do not, the um, impact of that can be quite high. So uh, th that's, a, uh, th that's an area which perhaps is overlooked in terms of prevention. But I see a very strong, uh, I see a very strong link between um, leadership capacity and prevention. Just very quickly, yes, I did an FOI uh, 18 months ago, which I'm just repeating, on the consultant contracts. Now, the consultant standard contract is 7.5, 2.5. That's the nationally agreed contract. 60% of all the consultants appointed since 2011 have been on 9-1. So how does that fit with your concept of leadership? If we're requiring our consultants to only have one session for audit, research, leadership development, continued professional development, training uh, of staff if they're not in a teaching hospital, you know, I, that's really not fitting with what you're saying. And I entirely agree with what you're saying about leadership. It isn't working. And the second question I asked was how many of them are converting? Because maybe you're saying, oh, well, you know, consultants now are, are, are starting younger. They don't have the same breadth of experience. They need to do the clinical work for a year. Well, that was what I was told by the board in Tayside, which I raised it with originally. Uh, and uh, I said, right, okay, well, how many are now converting after a year or two to 8.2 or 7.5? There's very little sign of conversion, very little sign. So, you know, I would just say, whilst agreeing with you, let's start with having these clinicians who are complaining quite strongly about being overworked uh, and stressed to... Uh, and, and we've got the highest vacancies we've had for a long, long time in terms of health service and consultants. Uh, so I'll just ask how you monitor that, because on the centre you can't control it. That's the boards that do it. But, I mean, you know, we have that national contract. How do you monitor it? What advice do you give them? And how does it actually fit with your leadership plans? Well, 
um, Dr. Simpson, maybe the simplest thing I could do would be to share with this committee what I, what, what I have written to the boards and what I have agreed with the Academy of Royal Colleges. I'd be, ve I'd be very happy to share that. Um, and Dr. Calderwood may have something to say in the meantime about uh, the approach we're taking to consultant contracts and to ensuring that consultants do have sufficient time uh, to develop themselves and develop the others around them. So, I, th I think this has been raised, and, and my colleagues are raising it with me, um, particularly um, some health boards where it's been applied more stringently. I suppose we, we need to remember that although it's 60% of consultants, it, that, that's a very small number of the total consultant body. Um, we, uh, we also need to remember that the many, many more jobs with more consult the same um, department has many more consultants within it. So that there is perhaps an argument that not everybody needs all of the time to do these extra things than was needed previously. Because, for example, in emergency medicine, we have 170% uh, uplift in consultant figures over a very short period of time. What we've, we're talking to the clinicians about is, is the standard being one PA, one session, but that, in fact, if they have coming to their interview or coming to their job plan to say, but I'm doing this teaching session, I'm also um, involved in college work, X, Y, and Z, that is actually able to be um, defined as time that is being spent properly and that the NHS is getting good value for that, that time, that in fact that is a, a negotiating stance that they can have with their health board. What I think we worry about was that people were being uh, automatically having a lot of time, and that's a lot of time in a week, uh, additional if it's not being used efficiently and effectively. And there was definitely evidence that it wasn't being, so, so people were, were going home early or doing other things with that time. So I think it's a, it's a matter of, of, of enabling with proper job planning that those sessions to be allocated, but only if they're going to be used properly for, for additional um, improvement to patient care, teaching, etc. I don't know whether anyone wants to come in about the, the wider um, workforce planning in terms of the overall strategy to take more people at at home, closer to home, near to home, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, well, obviously there's been some thinking going into that in terms of consultants and availability if they're at a conference or they're at a training session or they're not in the hospital. That impacts on the rota, it impacts on weekend cover, uh, you know, makes sometimes the job less attractive in, in smaller health boards, uh, uh, as I, I recall from my own experience in Inverclyde. Uh, you know, so... What, it might not be today, but I mean, a, a response today in terms of uh, workforce planning, what, what sort of, and, and, and how we view the total workforce, not just the consultant then, uh, because it will not be the consultant that's you know, providing that day-to-day, that, 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 that -day, hour-to-hour care at home. Um, um, uh, you know, do, what's, what's happening there? Uh, let, me, let me pick that back, uh, uh, if I could. Um, uh, I remember giving evidence about a year or so ago on, on just the very same topic, and at that point I think I used the term uh, we need to consider workforce planning as part of a triangulation of looking at um, what service we want for the future, looking at the available resources. Yeah. Um, uh, we do have, I think, uh, a very comprehensive framework, uh, which uh, if we haven't given it to the committee, maybe we need to do so. But uh, at the broadest level, that framework talks about three big principles. Um, three big principles are about designing the future workforce uh, around um, uh, an understanding of what new services will have on the current and future workforce, developing the workforce, and um, uh, Mr Gray made some reference here to one element of that, which was uh, leadership, and then delivering the future workforce. Yeah. Um, and against all of that, the framework, which I won't go into just now, um, clearly lays out um, a step-by-step -step methodology that we expect each NHS board to follow. It's a six, it's called, we call it the six steps uh, methodology, and that's contained in the guidance that we have. Um, and does that focus on the, the NHS workforce, or does it recognise that the new strategy will include, you know, 
um, yeah. the private sector, the voluntary sector, um, uh, and, and, uh, indeed, you know. and, and, and indeed integrated joint boards. I think what we have here is a framework. But does it? Does it? Is the framework you're talking about talk about the NHS workforce, or does it look at a broader view of the workforce and the, the strategies going forward? Um, in this here, in the, uh, in the guidance we've got, it by and large concentrates on the NHS workforce, but there is, there is reference here to the fact that planning for other groups, including voluntary services, should be taken into account. Mr Gay, you'll tell us what else is going on to join this up. So, um, when I came into this role of Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, I was, as part of that role, Chair of the Leadership Advisory Board. And when I took over the Leadership Advisory Board, that was a health service leadership advisory board. Um, I have changed that and in fact, as it, simply as it happens, uh, the second meeting of the new leadership advisory board meets tomorrow and that includes representation from uh, social work, social care, from the third sector uh, and that is deliberate because I didn't see how we could construct uh, a leadership development offering that was was narrowly restricted to the National Health Service. Within the directorate responsible for the integration of health and social care under the leadership of Jeff Huggins, um, we have a specific uh, work strand on workforce development, recognising that what we are doing here is asking uh, colleagues from health, from uh, local government from the third, the voluntary sector to work together in new ways and that simply saying that that would be a good idea and we hope they'll get on with it is wholly inadequate. We need to provide workforce development across all of the uh, elements of the workforce. And there's budget allocations that will drive that, is, is there? Okay. Yes. yes. Additional money? Or? Um, uh, it will be... Uh, to use the phrase, convener, it will be within existing allocated budgets. Oh. Nanette Millen. We didn't get to that bit at all, convener. It's how do we actually assign the budgets for that efficiency bit. I, I'm, I'm not clear on that. Sorry, Mr Robertson. Dennis is asking for an answer to his question about how we assign because there is a there is an issue about uh, the, the, how how the the budgets the integrated boards are being assigned and and there's some some differences there i think you responded and that yeah. it was a shadow year yeah. acknowledging yeah. there were some differences but i don't think that's satisfied dennis is it so you want some further clarification on that dennis it, it, it's because we looked at all the other aspects and uh, you know i was trying to say you know efficiency equals improvement and yeah. we're just trying to find out how you assign them because we looked at all the other aspects of preventing spend and how I was saying priorities and does something fall off the you know the the, the end because you've got to prioritize because you have set a, a efficiency targets. So so I was giving an example that's where yeah, we got into leadership, leadership discussion when I was giving an example of something that I was concerned might be given less priority because of the pressure on delivery. So Again, just to quote the discussion I've had with the Academy of Royal Colleges, concern expressed that newly appointed doctors and consultants would be given less time in terms of personal development because the focus was on you know, getting people through A&E or getting people through the hospital, and that would not be to their benefit. Um, Mr Matheson will come in in a second, but clearly efficiency is not all about simply stopping doing things it is some it is sometimes about doing things in a completely different way and doing it in an innovative way changing completely how we deliver a service so for example and again just to give one very simple example gentleman in Cumnock who has uh, COPD would have had regular visits uh, from a, a clinician or had to go regularly to uh, some uh, place where he could be uh, diagnosed and cared for is now able to have most of his care and diagnosis of any uh, uh, difficulties with his condition conducted over uh, telehealth over a video link. And I've seen that in operation. That is far more efficient, it's far better for the individual concerned. So that wasn't about stopping doing something, that was about doing something completely differently. Um, and therefore the efficiency gain uh, accrues to the individual and to the service. But Mr Matheson, do you want to say more about that? 
Thank you, Mr Gray. So efficiency to me is around doing what we do at the moment, but doing it in a more cost-effective way. So not a cheap way, but a more cost-effective way. Whereas innovation is doing things differently and in, in a more radical way. So in terms of uh, efficiency, we look at procurement, the, not just drugs, but the general supplies. We have a national procurement service for the NHS in Scotland. We're looking to look at how, in, in, in terms of health and social integration, where that expertise can be used in, in, in a broader area across the, the public sector. The, we look at the locum expenditure, both in terms of uh, nursing expenditure, medical expenditure, how can that be, be reduced? When I talk about financial performance in the efficiency context, I talk about quality-driven financial performance. Because if you get the quality right, then the, 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 the money tends to be going in the right direction. In terms of innovation, though, within the Scotland, we have eight innovation centres, and we have two within the health service. One of them is the Digital Health Institute, and it's just uh, moved from uh, the, the centre of Edinburgh out to uh, Lanarkshire, to uh, Eurocentral. And it's going to set up there a simulation laboratory where a ward environment, a home environment, will be set up to allow SMEs to come in and show their, uh, their, their uh, products, their innovative practices in a real-life environment and allow clinicians then to take a view on that in terms of the applicability. So efficiency, we have delivered £1.4 billion of efficiency within the NHS in Scotland over the last five years, and that has been reinvested back within the health boards. Mr Gray mentioned the performance at the end of 1415, which was just under £300 million, and boards have identified that they, they, they have identified a further £300 million of efficiencies, innovative practices, going into to 1516. We look at that very closely to ensure that it is about delivering best practice to ensure that the sharing of best practice to ensure that the efficiencies identified are consistent with our strategic direction and they are not they stepping back from our strategic direction. But for me, efficiencies have been very positive, but I think going forward we need to be more innovative in terms of where we look for solutions. Just on uh, you know, the evidence that we have here, the 3% efficiency phase savings applied across the board. We've heard this morning many of the boards have different challenges. Glasgow Health Board, Hep C, costs are that job. So, so how do they achieve? It's not a, neat, a uh, you know, there's a flat 3% saving, but there are different challenges on, on the board. As some other boards, they can make savings uh, on the prescribed drugs, uh, productivity, staffing, whatever, whatever. It leaves boards who have got a disproportionate pressure, like Glasgow, on Hep, hep C, costs of that. How, do, how does the Scottish Government discuss these, these varying pressures within that, that, that efficiency saving with the different boards. Convener, if I can come back on that, please. If I give the impression there was a, there was a set target, then I, I, I apologise for that. The, I was talking about the, the overall position within NHS Scotland. There will be a differential position within individual boards in terms of the, their individual targets but across the whole of Scotland it averages out at around about 3%. We, we assist boards in, in terms of the efficiencies by identifying best practice. The, Mr Gray's mentioned the, the, the common experience. We have a number of the European projects looking at the, the comorbidity and, and sharing of best practice across that. So we look at making sure that boards are aware. Prescribing is a good example. The, a number of boards are very high, going back to a, a, Mr. Doris's point about the genetic prescribing are very a, excellent performers in terms of genetic prescribing, and we share that best practice with the, the rest of Scotland. So we allow people to, to learn from best practice. But the efficiency savings are identified at a local level. But if we see something innovative, then we do make sure that other boards are aware of that, and the Corporate Finance Network and the other a fora are a part of that mechanism. Is there not a target of 3% each board has got you? There is an overall target across NHS Scotland, but individual boards will determine what their, their local needs are in and terms all, of... It, coincidentally, it comes out an average across the boards of 3%. It's, it's not coincidental. It is a, that, that's what it's been over a, over a number of years. Uh -huh. But we do not say that each individual board needs to achieve a 3% target. 
So what happens if they don't? So what happens if they say, well, this year on, they'll be saving 3% target, I'll not be saving anything because I've got all these costs and prescribing. What happens in the process when that... That, that uh, situation has, has, has never occurred. That situation would mean that they would not be achieving their financial targets, which are statutory financial targets. Okay. What, we, what we do, if, 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 convener, is we do uh, ensure that they have, uh, they have all the information available to them of uh, best practice, not just within Scotland, but uh, internationally, in terms of how they can improve the efficiency of the services they provide in a cost-effective way. I was just way. trying to establish whether a place like Glasgow was mentioned twice in terms of the beach and the cancer centre, disproportionate you know, costs there and the high costs of uh, you know, cancer drugs, uh, the hep C uh, with uh, the, the levels of uh, the problem in the population, whatever. We know that some of that will be preventive and have some long-term savings, uh, you know, but you know, how does that play into this you know, to this this financial plan and target. Where, where, where's the variance in that? Is there a flexibility in that, or is there a recognition that you know that? The, the the flexibility is for some of those high cost drugs, for example, hepatitis C. Then we do give a differential supplementary allocation to recognise mm -hmm. the fact that that is atypically weighted across the country. Right, Bob, did you want? Yes. Yeah, so I think Mr. Masson might have answered the question in relation to hep C drugs much more eloquently than, than I'm, I'm going to put it. My understanding is a, a, a lot of the new curative, quite revolutionary hep C drugs that, that, that are, that are, that are com now coming to health boards is through the new medicines fund. There's a huge chunk of, of, of in relation to that. So would that deal with cost pressures? But actually, as I was sitting there listening to talk about efficiency savings, it's my understanding that it's been the case for the last few years that if a board makes a 3% efficiency saving by redesigning services, the money that frees up stays within the health board. Is that correct? Because that's, that's important. absolutely correct, and that has always been the case. And that's the point I was making about the 1.4 billion historically, that those efficiency savings have then been retained by health boards and reinvested by health boards. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Mike McKenzie. Thank you, convener. I was interested in what uh, Dr Calderwood was talking about in terms of preventative spend and the, the health economics of that. And the, the interplay between finance and economics is quite an interesting one. And I, I wonder how that's reconciled in terms of, you know, typically um, we look at budgets usually on a yearly basis, targets maybe yearly, maybe, you know, in smaller uh, intervals than that. Um, and yet the, the results from preventative spend often manifest themselves over longer time frames. So, um, and I'm mindful of what Paul Gray was saying, in, in as much as very difficult to um, do a financial analysis of what those benefits um, of um, uh, preventative spend are. Um, so my question is twofold. How do, you, how do you decide how much of a budget in any given year that you're going to allocate towards preventative spend measures? Do you just think of a number and double it, perhaps? Um, is there some rationale uh, that goes on, a calculation? And then, secondly, is there, is there a higher um, strategic level overview and planning of spending beyond just the year-to-year the, the, the -year, um, finessing and reacting to targets? So... Two parts to the question. Okay, so I'll bring Dr. Calderwood and Mr. Matson and Mr. Cornichan, if he wishes, in on this. But um, we expect all expenditure in the NHS to be based on evidence. So, in terms of your question, do we just put a finger in there and say 3% or 26% on preventive? Absolutely not. If a health board advanced a proposition for preventative spend that we had no evidence base for it, we would say no. Uh, I think I can be perfectly clear about that. That, that, that. that would be part one. Part two, do we... Mr Matheson will speak in a minute about our long-term financial planning. We come, we come round this, uh, I have to say, every year. We do long-term financial planning and we take it very seriously um, not just one, two, three, but five and ten years. We look ahead to the demography that we, you know, we, the, the trends that we expect to see. Um, in our case, you know, the, the pressures of an ageing population and multimorbidity, and we plan for services 
uh, not just now, but for the future. Um, one of the things that I hope the integration of health and social care will do is help with the somewhat artificial barriers that if a saving was made in one place, the benefit accrued in another, and therefore you might question, well, why, why would I make a saving to benefit somebody uh, in another organisation? I, I do try very hard to see public sector money as a whole rather than as, as a series of pockets. So if I do something that helps the police service, I don't regard that as a bad investment. Um, I think the, the, the conversation then has to be about you know, what they might do to help me in the future rather than saying I won't do it because it's saving me nothing. Um, but Dr Calderwood might want to come in on the evidence base for preventive spend and then uh, John Conachan or John Matheson on the longer term as well. I, I suppose if we take the, the public health aspects of preventative spend, all of those are long-term strategies. So we, we all, albeit the, the money individually is allocated year on year or three yearly, we, we have, um, as you will know, Scottish um, health obesity strategy, smoking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those are those all have long-term goals. Interestingly, some of them have targets attached to in, in order enable us to keep working towards them. Um, financially, on a on a person by person basis, it's very difficult to measure it. Mm. And I think that that that's where we we always go back to say, well, if we do such and such, will that make a make a difference? So it's 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 definitely based on um, uh, clinical evidence. And I think more and more we've now got health economic evidence in everything we do. If we um, if we take the example of our investment recently in um, IVF treatment for fertility problems what I was tasked as part of that looking at the clinical evidence that if we were to change the the criteria what would that do for the success of the treatment and of course in fact women who don't smoke women who are of a healthy weight have much more successful IVF treatment so you could argue on the one hand well you would why would you give something that's not going to be as successful this is an, a relatively invasive treatment to, to somebody where you knew that something would make it work more effectively. But in fact, so, so some of this is done on the basis of, of better clinical outcomes. But in fact, those sort of preventative, particularly around the obesity and smoking, as part of society as a whole, are actually going to make much um, investment in those, make much better um, use of our money in, in all sorts of other parts of the health service. If I can, if I can give you perhaps a, a practical example with some, with some figures attached to it that might be useful, because I think you're asking about a rational allocation model here. Um, so um, enhanced recovery uh, for um, patients undergoing surgery, um, one of the objectives of that is that patients spend less time in hospital, they're able to spend more time at home, and uh, you've got that, uh, I think, led very impressively by um, our, our clinicians. So this is something that started in the um, Golden Jubilee in the National Waking Time Centre a few years back and it was about um, mobilising patients almost immediately after joint surgeries such that they were up and, up and about and then could go home earlier. But there are also some clinical benefits about re reductions in catheterisation for patients. Um, uh, the results of a three-year pilot um, show that um, uh, catheterisation is halved in that select group of patients. Um, blood transfusion requirements have halved. Now, since that pilot started back in 2010, most boards have started to adopt enhanced recovery pathways. Um, that will drive some investment decisions about where they put some support in to achieve that, but it will also drive future investment decisions about how much they want to spend in surgery, orthopaedics, etc., and how they recycle some of that money. So that's a, a practical um, clinician-led change that started with a pilot, um, the investment in that pilot has um, proved um, uh, uh, to, to have paid for itself many times over as we have rolled that out the country. Um, and the last thing I probably want to say about that is that as we roll that out through the country, different boards are at different starting points in that. Um, it involves some change in clinical practice. Uh, and that's why you can see that boards sometimes have a differential savings target as they go through the year, using that as an example, because they might have started later, but they're still pursuing that. We would expect all boards to eventually get to a clinical model that's um, much more acceptable than that, uh, uh, using that as an example. 
Thank you. That's that's very uh, useful. I think if I may just have a couple of comments on that. The the first one is that I think the because we have annual financial targets in terms of breaking even within a 12-month period, there is a, a potential tendency to have a short-term approach in terms of financial planning. That is a, not sensible. You need a medium and long-term approach. So we have the Corporate Finance Group, which looks at planning assumptions over the last four or five, the next four or five years. But some of the, the, the major pressures that we're facing just now in terms of the pension increase in 15-16, the national insurance increase next year. We've known about those for the last four or five years, and finance directors have known about those and have included those within their planning assumptions. We have a 10-year capital plan, uh, which was uh, signed off by the, the, the previous cabinet secretary, and that uh, takes us forward over that uh, horizon. In terms of the strategic direction, we have our 2020 vision, and we have a financial plan that uh, underpins that. But the other factor there, Mr Mackenzie, which is an important factor, is not micromanaging the boards in terms of the financial planning and their financial allocations. And what I introduced about three or four years ago now was the bundling of the uh, discretionary spends. The boards had flexibility over uh, how they spent that area. And uh, what I've done in 1516 for the first time for the three island boards is I've given them total discretion. So rather than even having just a reduced number of bundles, they will get one bundle of funding. They will still have to meet the <coughs> targets, the standards associated with these allocations, but they will have flexibility within that. And that has been generally welcomed by the island boards. And that's a model I would like to see going forward. So it does give boards that the financial flexibility at a local level. If they don't need to spend money on the alcohol services because they're meeting their target in terms of brief interventions, then they can divert that into other areas of local prioritisation. Mm. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by uh, um, that, that, the idea of this ra uh, rational allocation model. And obviously that's quite a sophisticated model, but I just wonder if it would be possible to... Um, you know, rather than this being an anecdotal discussion, a subjective discussion, where we all have our own hobby horses, um, I'd be very interested if, if uh, you were able to share uh, with the committee in written form um, some of the thinking or calculation that goes into um, the construction or the operation of a rational allocation model. Um, and it, it strikes me that that should be... Um, you know, used in the context of guidance. I take the point you make about the, the island boards and um, discretionary spending to suit local circumstances and challenges and so on. But it would be comforting to know that um, rational decisions are being taken, both in the short term and in the long term, bearing in mind the, the possibilities for preventative spend uh, and the tension that inevitably will always creep in in any budgetary discussion about, you know, spending for the here and now and spending for the longer term benefit. Well, so I'm certainly very happy, uh, Mr Mackenzie, to, to write further to the committee if they would find that helpful. I don't know if Mr Matheson, uh, convener, if there's time, can add more now or whether you'd rather just have something from us in writing about that. Well, it, it may be because I, I noticed that you mentioned the 2020 vision. And I note, noticed from uh, recent statements from the Cabinet Secretary and indeed in the Chamber last week, we're talking about 2020 beyond and 2030 now, which is, you know, drifted into the language. So it might be helpful. Uh, you know, I don't know whether that's due to financial considerations or whether that's been tweaked for some other reasons. But, uh, you know, just a, a, a note about that in, in the context of 2020 and beyond would maybe inform the committee uh, and, 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 and satisfy my colleague uh, uh, Mike McKenzie and, uh, and his inquiries. I've got a supplementary, I think, from Colin Kerr. Is it a supplementary or a question? Yeah, yeah, it's it's supplementary just, uh, on this, this section. Yes, thanks, yeah, Colin. Well, thanks very much, Convener. Um, very quick one, really. It's something about what Mr Gray said earlier in relation to the public pot being, as, in his view, just being one as against uh, several, if you like. And uh, it just came down, maybe you've answered this before, it's just I haven't picked up on it, but the strains between the different sides setting up the joint in integration boards. Has there been any 
difficulties with um, people being a bit overprotective of budgets in, in this? Well, <clears throat> all of the uh, all all of the uh, integrated joint boards have delivered their integration schemes on time by the first of April this year. Um, I'm absolutely certain, uh, Mr. Keir, that the health. Uh, and the local government components of this will have thought very carefully about what elements of the budget uh, they would they would put into this. Um, but I would I would be hesitant, to be honest, to at this stage to suggest that that any aspect of this, whether it was health or local government, have been protectionist about it. I think what what we'll be doing in the course of this year is to look at the budgets uh, with with the um, partnerships and ultimately we have to give ministers assurance that the budgets are sufficient to meet the um, uh, to deliver the outcomes that the partnerships have been set up to deliver uh, but uh, I mean it would be fair to say that uh, you know both local government and health uh, do face pressures as a result of the demographic trends and the the changes in the uh, state, health status of the population over time that we expect to see. Um, but so far, uh, I have seen very good evidence of joint working. Um, the uh, rate of delayed discharge in uh, Fife has con come down very considerably. And, and just to be simple about it, that is because I I'm certain there have been some fairly tough uh, discussions between the health board and the council. Indeed, I know there have been, but they have been committed to achieving a solution. So I don't actually mind if people have robust discussions. In fact, frankly, it's sometimes worse if people say, oh, we've all got very good relationships with one another, but nothing much actually happens. I'd really rather people got to the nub of the difficult issues. I don't see that as protectionism. I don't see that as in any way... Um, deviating from uh, the overall standards that we set. I think it's important that people have these robust discussions, and I can see that where they do happen, results are produced. Um, that's a rather long answer to a short question. <laughs> well, we move to directly to Nanette Millen. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, mean, I had been going to ask about deficiency savings, but I think that's been dealt with quite, quite a lot, so I'll change tack. But before that, could I just maybe maybe more a comment or flag up for future discussion? The, the emerging serious issue on recruitment and retention of doctors in general practice. I know there are other ways of delivering general practice, but I think there is becoming quite a, quite a lot of parts of Scotland now, I think, a serious issue, and I think it will have to re revisit that as, as we go forward. But I, I wanted to raise the issue of palliative care, um, because um, some boards said it wasn't possible to separate out general care from palliative care. Um, others gave information on either specialist care or general care. Um, so I just wondered, um, how is it possible to get data on providing palliative care costs and how the availability of this information can be improved? Um, and if there's not financial data, how can government assess whether appropriate resources are being devoted to palliative care? And the so next point on that is to do with CHAS funding, where there's you know, an agreement between health boards um, to... to provide Tayside with, I think it's 12.5% of funding, and then that's coordinated to fund CHAS. And I don't think that's being met by a number of health boards. So maybe some comment on that as well. Please. Thank you um, for that. Um, on, the, on, the, on the CHAS funding, um, I, I, I'd got uh, some information about that this morning, which uh, is therefore not in my pack. So what I will do is I'll write, I'll write to the committee about that point, because I, I did think it would come up. Um, but it uh, um, would involve me switching my mobile phone on to get it, so I'll not, I'll not do that right now. But I will write to you about that uh, on, on that specific question. Um, on the palliative care element, and I'll bring Dr Calderwood in in a second, um, where, where someone is receiving palliative care as an element of, of, of other care that they may be receiving, then it, it, it is genuinely difficult to separate out the palliative elements. And I, I mean, we had a discussion and evidence about this recently. Um, I, I, I am clear that we could 
we could do more to separate it out, and I think I undertook uh, in the uh, in the evidence session then to consider that further. But uh, the way the way information is recorded at the moment does not make it particularly easy to separate it out. Um, and therefore, you're right to ask the question: How do we know if it is sufficient? Now, one of the ways in which it's a slightly different point, but one of the ways in which I'm seeking to advance this is to ensure that more uh, individuals have anticipatory care plans so that we're much clearer about what individuals are looking for, um, particularly as they come towards the end of their lives. But Dr Calderwood, do you want to add anything on palliative care? Um, and you, you maybe are already aware that there's a, a commitment to a strategic framework for action on palliative care. Um, I, I, I concur with Mr Gray that the, the, the difficulty that you're pointing out with the data and the way that we're collecting it or rather not collecting it at the moment doesn't enable us to really understand what is going on in different boards and perhaps that, that's partly why they can't articulate it to your committee. Um, th there will be stakeholder events, engagement events, which are planned in different parts of the country as part of the development of that strategic framework. And what we'll be, uh, I'll be doing particularly is keeping a very close eye on that to ensure that some of the points that you're concerned about are, um, are, are, are brought up in discussion and we, we find a, way, a better way forward. That, that's helpful because I mean, it's, I think the anticipatory care planning is very important too. Because we, we know from people like Marie Curie, there are many people who really ought to be receiving palliative care who are, are currently not, and they need to be identified very early on so that that could be planned for. And I look forward to more information on that. D did that amount to a commitment to to try and establish some sort of database? for what is available. Did I, is that right or is, it, is that correct? Yes, Convener. We need, to, we need to improve the information we have. And as Dr Calderwood has said, we're going through the strategic framework for action. We're seeking to improve um, both the, the delivery of palliative care, our understanding of what people actually want through uh, their anticipatory care plans, and the, the information we have to assure us that palliative care is being delivered appropriately and in appropriate settings. So, yes, we want. I mean, we absolutely want to improve this. I, mean, I, 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 I seen some briefing papers that was like yeah. two thousand and eight or something. Well, yeah. well, it was almost like an audit. I mean, yeah. You know, in terms of how many beds, who yeah. was providing palliative care or not, or whatever, whatever. So, <coughs> is, is that a baseline that's worth anything at all? Are we building on that? Are we just, or are we starting something completely new? I think we need to refresh what we have. The 2008 information is as good, you know, is, is is good as far as it goes. But I don't think it's it's information that is going to take us much further forward. I think I wrote to the committee about this fairly recently, um, and uh, in the last evidence session, um, Mr. Mackenzie asked uh, how many people had palliative care plans, how many people needed them. Um, you know, and my my answer was I want to get towards as uh, you know as as far as possible, everyone having a palliative care plan. That said, the evidence suggests that about 70% of the population would benefit from having, you know, someone who dies suddenly or any other, certain other situations, a palliative and anticipatory care plan is, is not actually either necessary or helpful. But um, the evidence, such as it is, suggests that roughly 70% of the population would benefit, and we're quite away from that at the moment. Are you Keep the committee up to date yes. about that. Thank you. And no other questions? Good. Um, that, that, that's, uh, that concludes our session. Can I thank you all for your attendance this morning, the, the evidence you provided. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we now suspend at this point until we set up our next panel.
We now move to uh, agenda item uh, number four. Uh, on today's agenda, um, we're going to have two evidence sessions on smoking prohibition children motor vehicle Scotland bill. Um, uh, our second evidence session on, on that bill. And can I welcome Simon Clark, uh, Director of Freedom Organisation for the Right to Enjoy Smoking uh, Tobacco. Um, thank you for your attendance this morning, uh, Mr Clark. And uh, we're going to, in the interest of time, we're going directly to and we've got your written evidence. We'll go directly to the, our first question, which is Richard Lyle. Mr. Clark, can I say to you that I'm a car driver and I am also a smoker, and I don't feel threatened by this bill. Uh, in regard to your position, Forrest does not support the introduction of a ban on smoking in cars carrying children. We would encourage adults to not smoke in cars carrying children because in our view, children should not be exposed to cigarette smoke in a small, confined space. But you then go on to say, in our opinion, however, there's no justification for the government to ban smoking in any private vehicle or, uh, with or without children. So how do you square your position? You say you, we shouldn't smoke in our cars because children are in them, but then you say, well, but the government shouldn't ban it. How, how do you explain that? Well, I don't think you should ban everything um, just because it might not be wise or parents should err on the side of caution with certain things. Um, I mean, we've said for many years that smokers need to be considerate to people around them, um, not just adults, but particularly children, clearly, particularly if you're smoking in a confined space. So we don't condone and we certainly don't encourage people to smoke in a car with children. And I think over the last 10, 15, 20 years, I think huge numbers of smokers have actually changed their behaviour because they realise it's wrong. And the reality is very, very few people still smoke in a car if children are present. And I would like to think that we could give credit uh, to smokers for having changed their behaviour, for having become increasingly considerate to people around them, and say children in particular, we don't think legislation is necessary for a number of reasons. First of all, as I said, I think very few people uh, still do it. Um, people often say, well, what about the, the seatbelt law when that came in in 1982? The point then was that, my understanding, is only about 25% of people actually wore a seatbelt at the time. So it was decided that in order to get, uh, you know, increase that number uh, significantly, they had to bring in a law. We don't need to do that with uh, smoking in cars with children because, say, the vast majority of smokers wouldn't dream of lighting a cigarette in those situations. I mean, they feel like you. They don't feel particularly threatened by uh, legislation coming in. But I don't see why we should bring in legislation when it's not particularly necessary. So few people do it. I think also, as we may hear in the next session, I think it is going to be legislation that's going to be very, very difficult to enforce, um, perhaps you know, we might want to come on to that a bit later. But I do think, um, if you're asking the police to enforce it, if you've got somebody driving along at 20, 30, 40 miles an hour, they may be smoking a cigarette, but how anybody is going to tell whether there's a small child in the back, I honestly don't know. The only way that you could do it is to have spot checks, pull drivers over. And I personally think that is a, a waste of police time uh, in order to do that. Well, I, I actually have two grandchildren. I actually have two uh, child seats in the back of my car, uh, and, and I don't smoke in my car when my grandchildren are, are in the car. Um, so, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, police can spot you as you're going along on the phone, most of the time without your seatbelt. And I'm sure they could spot two kids in the back with, uh, if I was sitting in the front, not, uh, not that I would be doing this, by the way, um, but they were smoking a cigarette. But can I come on to the point that also um, the British uh, Lung Foundation said that 19% of children 11 to 15 reported being exposed to cigarettes, 51% of children aged 8 to 15 reported being exposed to cigarettes, and also the research has shown that 86% of children across the UK want people to stop smoking when they're in the car when they are in a car. Um, what do you think of those figures? 
to be frank, I, I am slightly sceptical about them. I think uh, introducing legislation on the basis of surveys of children of that age is frankly um, a, a bit dodgy. I, I simply don't think you can uh, assume that children are being in totally accurate uh, when they respond to questions of that sort. I mean, I would like to think, before legislation is introduced, that proper hard evidence, not just the opinions of children, um, is brought into account. Now, for example, in Dublin, um, they did some research, University College Dublin did some research two years ago, when they monitored 2,300 vehicles, I think, during rush hour uh, in Dublin, as people were taking children uh, to school. And of those 2,300 vehicles, only eight drivers were smoking. And of those eight drivers, only one driver had a child in the back. And similar research was carried out in uh, New Zealand, much, much bigger survey. Um, I think it was uh, something like 189,000 um, vehicles, a huge number. And they found literally there was just a handful of vehicles where the driver... Uh, were smoking with children in the back. Now, I accept those are other countries, uh, albeit English-speaking countries, but I would like to see similar research carried out in Scotland to find out exactly how much of a problem this is, because I don't think, in terms of numbers, it's as much as a, uh, of a problem as is being made out. And I just come from a position where, and I believe in education, not legislation, if at all possible. I think legislation should be a last resort. And we would happily join with the Scottish Government in a, a media campaign uh, to encourage the handful of people who still smoke in a car with children not to do it. Say, look, you know, think of the children. This is inconsiderate. Don't do it. And I personally think we should be looking at doing that before we go the whole hog and introduce legislation. Um, I think also it's important that we don't uh, stigmatise uh, the vast majority of adult smokers, because when you introduce a law like this, I think it does stigmatise smokers. You're basically saying to smokers, you don't know how to uh, behave around children. And I think that's wrong. And also, the reason it's important to us is because, symbolically, this is quite an important step, because it's the first time you're actually banning smoking in a private space as opposed to a so-called public space. That, and that, that's where I think you, you get to the nub of your argument is that you feel it's an encroachment on people's civil liberties. I don't feel threatened, and, and I'm, I smoke, and I smoke in my car. Um, but, you know, you, you're basically saying, well, if, if, if you allow this, you then will ban everyone from smoking in their car. Where are you going to go next? Are you going to ban us from smoking in our house? Uh, and what, where are you going to go next? Are you going to put us all in a desert island somewhere? Um, but, uh, convener, if you just allow me, the, the, the also one of the arguments you've got is that the police shouldn't do this, that we should have environmental health officers doing it. What are we going to do? We're going to, have, we're going to station environmental health officers in streets uh, to check a street because we certainly can't have them driving around looking to find out if they can spot, spot the smoker. Um, you know, is it not, if this comes in, the police have done well in seatbelt uh, uh, legislation, done well in, in uh, car phone legislation, so at the end of the day, I'm sure the police in their cars could spot someone with child seats in the back if they're sitting smoking. Well, I, I mean, I, I can't speak for the police. Obviously, they're going to uh, speak on that subject a bit later. Um, I mean, again, just as a, a member of the, the public, I personally, uh, you know, not knowing enough about uh, the police's work, I would have thought they have enough to do without um, criminalising another section of society and, you know, pulling cars over to check that the driver who might be smoking, whether or not he's got a car in the back. You said earlier they can tell quite easily there's a child in the back. Well, I disagree. A lot, of, a lot of cars these days have tinted windows in the back. You'll never see if there's a small child there. And I think it, we have very serious concerns that as soon as this legislation is introduced and enacted, the anti-smoking lobby will come back and they will say, right, 
let's ban smoking in all private vehicles, regardless of whether children are present. We know that's going to happen because, in fact, the British Medical Association, since 2011, has been calling for a ban on smoking in all private vehicles, regardless of children being present. Ash in London uh, published a report called Smoking Still Kills. It's their five-year strategy. And in it, they want a consultation about banning smoking in all private vehicles. Now, we know where that's leading. They want a ban on smoking in all private vehicles. So you'll have a situation where a lone driver, sitting in his own car, on his own, lights a cigarette, suddenly he's a criminal, and he's, you know... Um, going to be prosecuted for it. I think that's very, very worrying. And you say we won't have a ban on smoking in the home if children are present. I, I certainly hope not. But likewise, I hope that parents will um, you know, be considerate and will have perhaps one room where they can smoke or they'll smoke in the garden. These are all important things. But let's face it, it's 15 years ago. Nobody, nobody thought we were going to have uh, a smoking ban, public smoking ban, that would not allow smoking in any, every, any single pub or club, including working men's clubs, in the country, nobody foresaw that back in the year 2000. And yet within you know, uh, five years, six years in Scotland, we had a comprehensive ban. Another year, we had a comprehensive ban in England and Wales and so on. So I think it's very unwise to predict and say, no, these things aren't going to happen because I'm afraid the uh, tobacco control lobby has a policy called the next logical step. They are never satisfied. And they'll go from a ban on smoking cars with children to a ban on all private vehicles, and they will up the ante, and they will try, if not um, to uh, actually ban smoking in the home, they will quite likely try and sort of almost name and shame people, make people feel incredibly guilty about having the temerity to light a cigarette. I mean, I was doing a, a phone-in on the Radio Scotland this morning, and somebody was saying, we need to ban um, mothers who are pushing their buggies. Um, and they might be smoking at the same time. So, again, where is this going to go? Are we seriously going to ban uh, you know, a, a mother from pushing her buggy in the park and smoking at the same time? Um, a lot about... It, I, I, I'm a great believer in education. The big uh, drop in smoking rates in this country happened between the mid-70s and the early 90s, and it was all about education, educating people about the, the health risks of smoking. What we've seen over the last 15 years in Scotland and the UK generally, um, yes, the, the smoking rates have continued to fall, but you know, not by huge amounts, and yet we've had a whole series of pretty draconian legislation, a uh, ban on smoke, uh, tobacco advertising and sponsorship, we had the smoking ban, a uh, ban on uh, vending machines, ban on uh, uh, display of tobacco in shops, and of course now there's plain packaging. All these things have had relatively little impact compared to the basic education, health education that people were given back in the 70s, the 80s and 90s. And I'm just concerned that we are legislating for legislation's sake. And I'm not convinced it will have any significant impact. Because the sad fact is, those people who are antisocial enough and inconsiderate enough to smoke in a car with children will probably just ignore legislation. And you mentioned that the mobile phone legislation has been a success. I, I'm not convinced it has been, to be honest. And, of course, before the mobile phone legislation was brought in, there were some very, very clear cases of accidents involving lorries, drivers on their phone, where cyclists, for example, were being killed. Um, I mean, I, I'm not... Um, going to refute. I mean, I'm not suggesting there is no risk to a child's health uh, from somebody smoking in their presence. But um, as I say, there are very. I mean, you would have to be. The point about the passive smoking evidence is that you have to be exposed to uh, in, uh, environmental tobacco smoke consistently, day after day, month after month, year after year, perhaps for 10, 15 years for it to have any significant impact. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that we turn ourselves, go back to the 60s or the 70s, but the fact is, in those days, a majority of the population smoked, and children grew up in smoky households, which you know, we don't want to go back to. They grew up, been brought up in, uh, you know, having been transported in smoky cars and vehicles. And yet that baby boom generation is living longer and healthier lives than ever before. Now, before anybody jumps in, clearly, I'm not you know, associating the two things. What I'm saying is I do think sometimes the impact of secondhand smoke is exaggerated, and it's done so 
uh, to make smokers feel guilty about their habit. And I'm a non-smoker, I'm a lifelong non-smoker, and I just feel uh, the attacks on the smokers over the last 10, 15 years has been disproportionate. They're an easy target, and it's very easy to make a smoker feel guilty. And I don't think smokers should, be, uh, should feel guilty, as long as they smoke responsibly and considerately, because they're uh, smoking a legal product, making a huge contribution through tobacco taxation, to the sort of finances of, of, of the country and so on. And I think we've got to draw a line and say, look, in, you know, enough's enough. We've got a public smoking ban, we've got a display ban, we're getting plain packaging. Where is this all going to end? Mr Clark, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Richard, Richard uh, Simpson. Yes. Can I just correct one thing, and that is that Kenny Gibson, with my support, moved... A bill in 1999, we were proposing that there should be a ban on smoking in, in restaurants anywhere where food was being served. So bans in public places were not something that was actually post-2000. It was before 2000, one of the first things that was done in, in this parliament. And I should declare that I'm on the co-convener of the um, tobacco cross-party, tobacco and health cross-party group. But if I can summarise your arguments, they are we shouldn't do it because it's a slippery slope. Uh, we shouldn't do it because it's small numbers, and we shouldn't do it because uh, it would be difficulty in enforcing. Well, can I suggest to you that actually uh, there was real concern about the public smoking ban, and that this would there would be riots on the street, uh, people would uh, would um, uh, act against this. This was an infringement of liberty uh, that was g going far too far, and that secondhand smoke actually could be dealt with by pumping the stuff around or air conditions or whatever, which was clearly was rubbish. But the fact is that people obey the law. And by your own admission, it is the irresponsible individual who smokes in the car, not the responsible smoker. And surely, the, the, in protecting children, which is what this law is about, it's not about the smoker, it's about protecting children. Are you really saying that we should not seek to protect children uh, as a, a parliament uh, by passing legislation which ensures that they are not exposed to second-hand smoke which we know from the research, and I wonder if you accept this research, uh, Mr. Clark, we know from the research that the, the smoking in, in the enclosed uh, circumstances of a car, the, uh, the levels of pollution are actually hugely higher than they are in most other circumstances. It's one of the most polluting set of circumstances that there are. Personally, I... I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert, so I'm, I, I, I suppose I shouldn't really uh, answer that question. I do think that parents should err on the side of caution. It's common sense. When you've got small children, babies in particular, any parent, I think, um, should and most would err on the side of caution. I do think um, a lot of the research into passive smoking uh, has either been flawed or the, if you take the largest study ever done into passive smoking... Um, carried out in California, uh, where they studied a group of 119,000 people between, I think it was 1959 and 1999, that found no significant <laughs> impact uh, of passive smoking. I think the problem with the research that's been carried out in cars is that it's, it's inconsistent because there are so many variables, you know, um, whether a window is open, uh, even a, a window being open one inch, two inch, three inches, it all makes a huge difference. And often the research that we've seen focuses on that moment, which may be literally a few seconds, when the car is smoky, somebody's just lit a cigarette, and there's you know, a significant um, amount of smoke in the car. Within seconds, that smoke has normally been massively diluted uh, because there's a window open or whatever. I mean, so I don't want to come across that I'm um, justifying it or defending people who smoke in cars with children. I I'm not. I simply think that legislation is excessive. And if I may just step back a bit and talk about the, uh, uh, the, the smoking ban that came in Scotland in 2006, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I still think that was grossly excessive. I totally accept that it's fine to ban smoking in, in restaurants. Banning smoking, a comprehensive ban, every single pub and club in the country, not even allowing designated smoking rooms, I think is absolutely outrageous. And, uh, and I still believe that. Uh, here we are nine years later. And actually, I'm not alone, because we did a poll only last week before the ASH um, report came out. 
a populist poll, 2,000 uh, random sample, 2,000 uh, people, and we asked them the question, would you allow well-ventilated, designated smoking rooms in uh, pubs and private members' clubs? 57% said they would allow them. So the idea... Uh, I totally accept people obey the law. People don't want to get their landlord or publican into trouble, so they, they abide by the law. But the idea that the smoking ban has been uh, a, is hugely popular, I would dispute that. It's very high compliance rates, uh, I totally grant you. But when people are often are asked, uh, would you allow well-ventilated, designated smoking rooms, people, generally speaking, in the majority, favour that. And the idea... He said that this, it's complete nonsense, the idea that you can have a so essentially a well-ventilated smoking. Well, it's not. Modern technology actually um, can solve the problem of environmental tobacco smoke uh, extremely well. Um, sadly, we've not gone down that route because I think what underlies this legislation is a desire to stop people smoking. I think this is what it's, uh, it, it's come down to. Uh, despite the fact that tobacco is a perfectly legal product, there is a program. I mean, we we know it because there's pe people talk about making Scotland smoke free by what is it, 2035 or 2030, whatever. Um, the reality is, if you leave smokers to, uh, alone, smoking rates will continue to fall slowly because uh, a number of reasons. Uh, health is a, is a serious issue. Um, a lot of people start smoking, as we know, when they're quite young, but a lot of people give up in their 20s, their 30s, when they start having families themselves and they don't want to smoke around children and all the rest of it. So we'll continue, continue to see a decline uh, in smoking rates, but it'll be a gentle decline. Unfortunately, that's not good enough for um, the tobacco control lobby. They, they've already sort of set a target, getting um, Scotland to be smoke-free by 2035, which, by which they say smoke-free is 5% of, of the population. The only way they will get smoking rates down to 5% is to uh, you know, introduce more and more bans, more and more legislation restricting uh, where people can smoke. Uh, the way we're going, eventually they won't be allowed to smoke in a, in a public park. They'll, they're starting off by banning smoking in children's play areas, even though they're in the open air. Uh, we know some councils in England are now having exclusion zones around uh, play areas. Eventually they'll say you can't smoke anywhere where a child might be present. These rules and regulations are not being brought in because, um, for health reasons because nobody is arguing that smoking you know, in the open air is a risk to any bystander, whether they're an adult or, or a child. The argument now is we don't want you to smoke in a public park or anywhere near children because we don't want you to be a bad role model for children. Uh, if a child sees a, uh, you, know, you smoking in a park, it might encourage that child to take up smoking. Well, again, there's no evidence for that. No evidence that children take up smoking because they see a complete stranger smoking. Uh, all the evidence suggests that children take up smoking because of peer pressure or because of the influence of family members, which is, again, is another reason why um, some people are trying to crack down on sort of family members smoking, whether it's in the car or at home or whatever, because there's this sort of desire to stop uh, you know, uh, parents from smoking in case they then become bad role models for their own children. But you know, at the end of this, we must remember tobacco is a legal product. And I would have far more respect for people who came out and said, let's ban tobacco completely, you know, instead of which um, governments are more than happy uh, to put 86% taxation on tobacco. That's the average taxation on a pack of cigarettes in this country. 86% goes to the government. So, uh, again, it comes back to this, this, this principle. Let's try and discourage the few people who smoke in a car with children present. And say so Forrest would be more than happy to join with that campaign, um, as, long as, it, as long as it was an educational campaign, not threaten people with fines and penalties and all the rest of it. Uh, we feel the same way about litter. Uh, we would like to uh, in, encourage smokers to uh, not drop litter but it's a two-way thing it needs um, you know, it needs some help not it's a rather draconian bullying tactics where smokers are being threatened with fines and other penalties if they uh, uh, if they drop litter or say if they if they smoke in a car so we can add passive smoking research is not valid 
and uh, well, no, you're exaggerating. research in the cars are I not think, valid. I, I think that's what you're saying. I'm not so saying research it's not is not valid, valid unless it supports your I, case. I think I'm not. I'm, th I, I'm saying I think the threat of secondhand smoke has been exaggerated because most children, if they are, and again, I can't repeat often enough, I'm not encouraging people to smoke in a car with children. I would urge anybody to err on the side of caution. Um, but I do think that the research uh, exaggerates the risk because in real-life conditions, most children are only exposed for a very short time well, um, to other people's tobacco I, smoke. I have to say, Mr Clark, the reason the government didn't accept Kenny Gibson's proposals in 1999 because at that point the passive smoking research wasn't good enough but within two to three years a lot of the studies that were being undertaken were completed and did demonstrate very clearly that passive smoking is, has an effect not as much as direct smoking but nevertheless a significant effect and that's one of the reasons why the government actually adopted the public health smoking ban which is, was also about protecting workers within the restaurant and pub trade from exposure to smoke because they're working there all day so we, you know as far as I'm concerned we will go on trying to protect people from the effects of irresponsible smokers uh, in cars and in other places. The problem is Thank that you. workers could have been protected by having designated smoking rooms. No we tried that, that uh, Susan Deacon said when she was refusing to take that bill up we will actually introduce uh, 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 ventilation systems and, and it was very clear from the research that was subsequently done that that was ineffective. So the technology may have moved on, but at that time it certainly was ineffective. It was a SOP. Well, that's in the past. We're dealing <laughs> with another bill today. Uh, any other questions on, on, on the, the bill before us? Dennis Roberts. Just, uh, very quickly, and uh, almost to Clark. Um, I'm a bit confused because you, you say you would have more respect if they just banned tobacco altogether. Well, fair enough. There'd be no taxation. You know, I'm not saying that I would disagree with that either. But you keep referring to like small numbers and then huge numbers, but you don't actually associate the numbers. I think from the, the submission was it something like 24 percent of children are exposed to uh, smoking uh, in a vehicle that's quite a high number i don't see 24 percent as a low number because i actually think one child is too many if it's exposed to smoke and dr simpson mentioned the, the ventilation and yeah it gets rid of the smoke it doesn't get rid of the chemicals the toxins and that's what causes most of the damage. Um, so, you know, I, I I can hear what you're saying, but surely, um, and I did ask last week, is legislation necessary? Um, surely we should be doing more education. And the answer I got was, we've tried education. We continue with education, and we will continue with education with legislation because we deem that necessary. Don't you accept that argument? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> no, I don't um, think you would. I mean, no, I, I d well, I I'm not quite sure where you got the 24% figure. Our um, understanding is that um, from re research that's been carried out, it's mm -hmm. less than 13% of children are uh, exposed to tobacco smoke in a car. Uh, that's still probably too high. But in terms of being regularly mm -hmm. exposed, so you the, figure, too high. the yeah. figure is about 1% of people who are regularly exposed. If you're just exposed very occasionally, and that 13%, I don't believe that anybody's going to come to serious harm. But let's try and get that figure okay. down. And let's so, do it through so education, let, let, not let's legislation, let's which would be difficult number. to enforce. Okay. Let's take the number, 13%. Okay, you've no idea if any of these children have respiratory problems because it's just a number. Now, if an adult is smoking and it's irresponsible smoking and a child does have a respiratory problem, say asthma, for instance, um, you know, that's going to be exacerbated by. So what we're saying is we have tried the education route. We have done as much as we can, I think, through the education route. It's not working because people still think, well, so what? Now, if the legislation is there, it becomes law, and I think we've already seen that it does work within the public places. People have obeyed that legislation. They go outside. They don't smoke in a restaurant. They don't smoke in a pub. They don't smoke in a club. Surely 
you know, for the distance that maybe people travel with children in their car, um, smoking, we should just say absolutely not. Well, again, it comes down to the fact I think it's uh, patronising to the vast majority of smokers who know how to behave. I I'm a bit disturbed about some of the language you use. You talk, you know, you use a word like obey. Uh, tobacco control is called tobacco control for a reason, because a lot of people are beginning to feel it is all about control and that parental responsibility has actually been taken away from a lot of decent, uh, decent people. Now, if we basically introduce legislation on smoking cars, then what about uh, you know, the, the parent who has an overweight child? Are they going to be prosecuted? Um, you know, where, does this, where does this go to? I'm glad you mentioned asthma because uh, smoking you know, often gets the blame for, uh, for, for I asthma. I didn't say it was a blame for. I uh -huh. said a child may have and it could be exacerbated by Sure. Um, but, I mean, I don't think we've gone down the educational route when it comes to smoking cars with children. And I think that, as I say, a, a legislation should be a last resort. I think there should be a three-year uh, moratorium in which you do have an education campaign and you specifically target the issue of smoking cars with children. As I say, we would be more than happy... Uh, to support that campaign. Mm. But legislation, I believe, when you're talking about private vehicles, I mean, this is the difference. Pubs and clubs were public places in the sense that, you know, the public could go into them. I mean, they were still private businesses, so, but that's a different argument. But we are now talking about private spaces. And as I said to you earlier, I can guarantee that as soon as this law is passed and introduced, the tobacco control lobby will be back here. I'll probably be back here in five years' time, maybe less, three years' time, having this same discussion about banning smoking in all private vehicles. They ne they're relentless. They never stop. Of course, I, you know... I, you know, um, Mr Clark, uh, the, the thing I, I, I can't, you know, come, come to terms with, with with your argument, you seem to be accepting, it was a three-year moratorium, you're, you're um, accepting that children will still be exposed to smoke. In a, in a confined space, and you're happy for that to happen? Well, as I've tried to explain, I think the um, health impacts are exaggerated, but I hold my hands up. I, I'm not an expert on, on the subject. I did say earlier that a generation of children grew up in smoky households, smoky cars, and that generation of children is living, is the longest living generation in human history. Now, I'm not suggesting there's a correlation between the two things, clearly. But what I'm saying is that that baby boom generation of the 50s and 60s does not appear to have come to any long-term harm. And the reason I brought up asthma a few minutes ago is that it's interesting that in, during a period, 40-year period, where mm. smoking is halved in number, cases of asthma have tripled. And we know that allergies are, are a huge problem these days in the way they weren't 40, 50 years ago. And yet there is this obsession constantly with smoking and with giving smokers a good kicking. And I do believe, uh, I, I believe very strongly about this because say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a non-smoker. But mm. in my lifetime, and I grew up in Scotland, um, in my lifetime I've seen Scot uh, t smokers treated uh, abominably. Um, they are an easy target. What's happened since the smoking ban came in is that people are now complaining about the smell of tobacco. Now, that's got nothing to do with public health. It's simply because people are now so sensitive to any whiff of tobacco smoke because then most people are not normally um, exposed to tobacco smoke in, in, in our lives. We're not exposed to it in the workplace, very rarely exposed to it in the street. When some people sort of uh, get a little whiff of tobacco smoke, they react as though they've been shot. I mean, it's getting utterly ridiculous. And I think we've just got to have uh, a bit of uh, proportion here. And I think legislation to ban smoking in private vehicles is disproportionate to the actual problem. Uh, can I just agree with Dr. Simpson? It's about child protection. I'll leave it there, convener. I don't have any other questions from committee. No. Mr. Clark, thank you for your attendance here this morning, your written evidence, and um, uh, we'll move to the next panel. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Suspend at this point. Or
pause at this point and Uh, can I now uh, continue with our uh, uh, evidence session uh, um, and welcome Brian Ald, uh, Director of Professional Development, Royal, Royal Environmental Health Institute in Scotland. Welcome. Uh, William Hal Hamilton, Environmental Health Manager, Glasgow City Council. Uh, Professor Alison Britton, uh, Convener of the Health and Medical Law Committee of the Law Society uh, of Scotland. Margaret Wallace, Community Services Manager, Stirling Council. Uh, Bernard Higgins, uh, Assistant uh, Chief Constable, Operation, uh, uh, Operational Support, Police Scotland, and Chief Superintendent, Ian Murray, Police Scotland. Welcome to you all. And I'm going to go directly to our first question, uh, which is from Nanette Millen. Just go back. Um, I, I just want to open up the discussion about uh, enforcement of, of the bill, because it, it, I think it's one aspect that has actually given me some concerns. I, I note most of our evidence indicates that Police Scotland should be enforcing the bill, but some organisations, including Police Scotland themselves, don't agree that, that that should be the case. So I really welcome views from everyone as to just how how this, this uh, these proposals can be enforced and who should be taking responsibility for enforcing them. Yes, uh, good morning, convener. Uh, perhaps I'll just start. Uh, firstly, can I say that, that Police Scotland absolutely supports the, the introduction of this bill. Um, anything that uh, makes Scotland a, a healthier place and protects communities from harm, then we absolutely buy into it, uh, and there's no, no question of that. Um, we're also happy to be an enforcement agency in terms of enforcing the legislation, but there are some practicalities around it, um, and we don't believe that if you wish the bill to be as impactive as I, I believe you do, that we should be the, the sole enforcing agency. Um, the, the reason for that is quite simple. One of our key priorities is around reducing road deaths uh, and reducing uh, persons that are seriously injured on Scotland's roads. Uh, last year, fiscal year, uh, ending 31st of March, we had sadly 191 people killed in Scotland's roads. Um, as I understand it, uh, smoking was not a contributory factor in any of the fatal road accidents. So whilst there is absolutely clear health benefits for it, in terms of reducing the number of people killed in Scotland's roads, um, it wouldn't uh, necessarily be something that we would see uh, as having a great impact 
um, speeding, mobile phones, seat belts, uh, drink driving um, are the clear causal factors for, for fatal roads, road accidents and serious road accidents, and that's what we would uh, wish to continue to target. That said, uh, I, I do really want to emphasise that we do believe we would have a role to play in this. Um, we would be an enforcement agency, but I just want to make uh, the subcommittee and Parliament aware um, that in terms of, of how much we could contribute to it, um, perhaps uh, there, there would be benefit in extending um, the, the legislation to include, for example, um, environmental health officers, uh, local authority officers, traffic wardens, uh, the numerous people just now that are empowered to, to issue antisocial behaviour uh, tickets. Um, they could comfortably deal uh, with those people that are smoking in vehicles that are stationary. Uh, and I do accept that in terms of stopping moving, uh, moving vehicles on the road, only Police Scotland has the authority to do so. Um, but I would also contend that uh, there are a number of people that will smoke with children in their vehicle who are stationary at car parks, parked up. Um, uh, and again, um, the legislation could be extended to authorise other authorities to deal with that particular set of circumstances. But wholly supportive and happy to be one of the enforcement agencies. Mm. Uh, any, any other contributions? Yes, Margaret Wallace, thanks. Oh. Uh, I'll operate it, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stirling Council fully um, support the bill as well. Um, I think our view is that it should be a partnership approach, um, that Police Scotland should be the enforcing body, but it's actually about different partners playing their part as well, and it's of a wider prevention, intervention, education and enforcement um, and enforcement essentially for the people that aren't responsible um, and I think that it's a more, a more about a, a partnership approach f um, for us and as you say it's more about um, cars that are actually stationary um, from the council perspective um, obviously because um, that's a more practical element for us. Okay. Uh, yes please Professor. Convener. Uh, good morning. The Law Society are very happy to see the provisions within this bill and we welcome anything that will protect uh, our children in Scotland and we see this as a range, one measure in a range of measures for smoking cessation uh, strategy. Um, our concern then is also to try and make enforcement workable, practicable, with limited resources across all the organisations uh, pertaining to this. And one of them would be perhaps that the committee would consider uh, the responsibility of the driver. Rather than attributing responsibility for smoking and the penalties incurred on the person actually smoking in the vehicle, that the driver maintains control of the vehicle, he or she are responsible for the vehicle. We see this in relation to young children under the age of 14. The responsibility is incumbent on the driver that that child wears the seat belt and evidence has already been given how challenging it's actually going to be, not necessarily when it's young children in car seats, but children from the age of 12 onwards. It's so hard to know how, how old they are. We'd be wanting them to be carrying some form of photographic evidence for identity, their date of birth, something that might try and simplify that procedure and utilise resources effectively. Um, so the responsibility of the driver might be one way of, of taking that forward. Anyone else? Uh, Mr Old and then Mr Hamilton. I'll we'll just continue uh, down the line. Um, first of all, the Institute fully supports the premises um, of the, the bill. Um, my understanding is approximately well, about 79% of those who responded to the government consultation is fully support of Police Scotland undertaking um, as the lead enforcement authority for that. And we fully appreciate the difficulties and restrictions that Police Scotland are under, as is many um, public services um, across Scotland. The environmental health profession has had a leading role in the um, banning of smoking in enclosed um, public spaces. Um, between 2006 and 2012, there's been approximately 5,000 fixed penalty notices served across Scotland. But the one thing that's really important to recognise is that enforcement is part of a multi-model approach um, to smoking. So it does include a lot of education, a lot of guidance that we would fully support um, in line with this um, new um, legislative approach. The 
other point I would like to make is environmental health departments across Scotland routinely work with Police Scotland um, as it is. Um, we buy in, for want of a better word, the resources of Police Scotland, for example, with emissions testing. Now, there is some issues with that. It's very reactive. The chances are we are going to miss um, a lot of the individuals we would want to target with such legislation, but we would fully appreciate a partnership approach and a collaborative approach to undertaking enforcement activities within the bill. Mr Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'll just add my perspective from the point of view I'm, I'm here presumably to speak about the enforcement aspect from Glasgow City Council alone. I do, however, endorse uh, my colleague from Rehas's his views. We, we also support the bill. Um, it's just a cautionary note from our perspective that we, we have real difficulty seeing how environmental health can really engage with us to the kind of extent that would be meaningful. Uh, I, I take the point about the, the station of the vehicles, but in reality, we don't have the, the people on the ground uh, in, in the street to the same extent that the police do. Um, so intervening with a stationary vehicle, uh, yep, it, it, it's conceivable, it's feasible, but in terms of uh, the numbers involved, I really can't imagine it happening to any meaningful extent simply because the, the number of people involved uh, are so, so low and um, you know people are you know, might pick something like that up while they're travelling from A to B and I don't see there being any huge incentive for local authorities to enforce it in that way. If we do so proactively uh, in terms of stopping vehicles, again that would involve Police Scotland and we'd be more than happy to, to work in partnership in that way. It's just the concept of uh, intervening um, in an unexpected and unplanned way would, would be problematic and I say, un really, to be truthful, unlikely to happen to any great extent. Yeah. Thanks for all that. I'm certainly worried about the actual practicalities of what would trigger um, looking for young, well, identifying young people in the car. I, I can fully accept a lot of the talks have been about children and young children, car seats, and all, I can fully accept that. that I suppose relatively easy to find it, you know, select these people. I mean, I have a grandson who's 15 and 5 foot 2, and if he was sitting in a car, you could quite easily think he was over 18. And this legislation does go up to 18-year-olds. To, um, and what would trigger the investigation there? I mean, do we depend on these people saying that they're adult in the car with them is smoking? I, I just can't work out the practicalities of how we get to the stage of saying, accusing someone of smoking in a car with children. Any advice there? I think that's one of the reasons that, I'm just going back to the point we made about the responsibility being incumbent on the driver. Um, there's been some discussion earlier on about the success in relation to sanctions for not wearing, seat, um, not wearing a seatbelt if you're a driver, if you're using a handheld phone. The cameras can pick that up. It's clear and reasonably easy to evidence given the person sitting in the front of the car. Um, the reasons that you've mentioned as well, you could have somebody sitting in the back seat smoking, um, somebody could smoke a cigarette, inhale a cigarette, put it underneath the dashboard. Uh, I also have teenagers and I know how crafty they can be <laughs> in relation to passing cigarettes back and forward. They could stub it out by the time um, they're perhaps apprehended. The smell of cigarette smoke lingers a long time. Evidence is going to be so difficult. And since this is such an important component part of smoking cessation strategy, we have to make sure that we, we're as resourceful as we possibly can so be there. Well, I just want to, to support Professor's point of view that um, the concept of the, making the driver, the, the, the keeper of the vehicle responsible um, would mirror the original smoking ban legislation where... It was effective largely because the, the, the licensee, for instance, in a, in a pub would be held responsible for people on the premises smoking. So there was this kind of degree of you know, managing the, the compliance themselves. And, and I think that principle would apply also for the smoking in the car. Also, I think it would, to be truthful, make it more straightforward in terms of identifying the person responsible, simply because they are the keeper of the car. If it was the passengers uh, in the vehicle, it would cause us some significant difficulty especially if we were the uh, environmental health officers identifying or, or intervening in a situation there was no police constable available, uh, we might have some difficulty trying to get any 
uh, meaningful information out of the person involved. So, so can I ask yes, you, so do you can you imagine um, almost random checks on drivers? If you see a driver smoking or people in the car smoking, you're not sure, would you just target that particular person randomly? Is that how you envisage it working? There are two main ways in which it could happen. I would envisage them as colleagues in the police may have, you know, have a lot of comments to make on it, but one would be to respond to um, to complaint or accusation, which is you know not really going to be a major part of the work. Two would be to simply pick something up in passing to identify or to notice it, and then to add a third. And the third one would be the kind of uh, pulling vehicles over relatively random. That does happen at the moment for emission testing, for instance. Uh, it's pretty successful. It works well. Uh, we need to work in partnership with the police for that, but I, I can imagine that happening. It's probably quite effective in terms of sending out the message and getting the awareness levels up, which in itself is probably what's going to succeed in this case rather than any any real enforcement activity. Yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, again, um, there has to be a degree of pragmatism about how this would be, um, how it would operate. Uh, and again, our officers make judgment calls constantly, every day, every minute of every day, they will be deciding what action to take or not to take. Um, for example, kids that are in possession of alcohol um, and making the assessment of whether they're under 18 or not. So again, from a pragmatic point of view, uh, our officers are well versed in assessing the situation as they see it. So if they pass a car and they see somebody smoking within and they also see uh, child seats in the back, then that's a fair indication that the child will be under 18. Uh, but again, it would be about um, overlaying a common sense, pragmatic approach and considering every circumstance as it presents itself at that time. Uh, and again, just to, to clarify, um, there, there is no um, will for Police Scotland not to do this. Uh, what I'm simply saying is that there's perhaps opportunities to, to widen the number of authorities that can enforce it and there have a, a greater impact. Uh, and I do wish to make that absolutely clear. We're in no way abdicating responsibility for doing this, but I do want to be uh, very uh, frank with, with Parliament and, and uh, say about our capacity to do this over a long period of time. Uh, and there are other opportunities what as well. Would be necessary to ensure that community wardens, traffic wardens, what what, what what action would be necessary to 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 create that wider partnership? Is there, is there, is there any but, additional powers that we need to have? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I, I don't know is the answer. I would assume there would need to be some extension either to this legislation or, or local bylaws. But if you, you look through the walk through the streets of Glasgow, as I did at the weekend, I saw a number of community warden issuing fixed penalty notices for litter. Um, so again, whilst it might be a rarity, um, for them to have the ability to deal with somebody in a car that's smoking with a, a, a young child is better than not to have the ability, even if they don't use it on uh, many, many occasions. Uh, and again, I'd like to echo colleagues' uh, comments about partnership in education. Uh, it's something that we do in every aspect of road safety, right across the, the whole road safety spectrum. Um, so we are very much signed up to that, uh, and, and we would uh, absolutely work in partnership with, uh, with colleagues around the education aspect of the smoking. Um, so uh, again, um, there are opportunities here, um, uh, and again, we are very happy to, to, to offer our advice on that. Any any other response to? Yeah, I'll just add a, a couple of points. Um, the first one being that many local authorities throughout Scotland have warden-based services to meet the needs of their local community. Um, so they will go out and they'll do things like dog fouling, littering, and they are skilled um, with some legal procedures and the ability to serve fixed penalty notices. Another comment I would like to make is something that was quite missing from the bill is although we are looking at enforcement. There was nothing really mentioned about working with industry. So, for example, car dealerships and where people are actually buying cars, when cars are going for their MOTs, for example, and putting some advisory notices through that particular system. And that's another avenue that we would potentially ask government to consider. But there's no barrier to giving additional powers to people who are already existing powers through litter and... There's no barrier per se. It's easily done. No, it, it comes only down to... Um, training and competence um, with the officers we're giving those powers yeah. to. Mike McKenzie wants in. If nobody else covers it, we need to come back to some of the other 
maybe unintended uh, consequences like uh, getting it right for every child in the, in the Children's Act and and um, the potential what was mentioned earlier about third parties reporting smoking in cars and how that would be dealt with. But Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, it was uh, my question is really directed at Professor Button because I'm I'm a bit surprised at the Law Society in suggesting this kind of vicarious liability on the part of drivers for somebody that might happen to light up a cigarette and just at that moment, uh, you know, a passenger and the driver could ask them to desist or whatever, but they may be on a motorway, they may be in a bit of road, but it's just not possible to stop. Um, and Assistant Chief Constable Higgins or one of his sharp-eyed colleagues happens by at that moment, the blue light goes on and the poor old driver is... Um, I wonder what sort of, if you were representing a client in court who happened to be a driver of that vehicle, what kind of defence would you mount on his, you, you know, in, in, in order to try and prevent his conviction? And then I've got a further point about the, the, the nature of this being a form of summary justice um, and perhaps the, the police feeling under some kind of pressure to um, uh, produce a set of statistics that show that they're enforcing this um, and again just the, the, the opportunities for and I take it that you know I'm not implying any good faith on, or bad faith rather on the part of the police but you know the, the, the opportunities for mistakes about age of children you know I know some 18 year olds that look younger um, you know and uh, just take you back to your days as a law student when justice was perhaps maybe more uppermost in your mind than I'm getting the sense that it Ooh. possibly is now. Oh, Mr Mackenzie, that's a terrible thing to say. In, in, um, in, indeed. Uh, thankfully, um, I'm an academic. Uh, I won't be defending or representing anybody in court. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you talked about vicarious liability. Um, a driver of a vehicle, I think, has a very, very special responsibility in relation to road safety. Now, I know that here we're talking about the health and well-being um, of the occupants of that vehicle. So, point that um, the example we already made was that if a child under the age of 14 is not wearing a seatbelt, then the responsibility for that child to wear the seatbelt is incumbent with the driver. Um, there hasn't been anybody that's given evidence this morning, uh, in this session, who is not very, very supportive of this bill. And the issue then seems to be effectiveness, um, a good use of resources, and ensuring that if this legislation is going to be passed, that it is as effective in protecting young people as it possibly can be. So I'm certainly not trying to be draconian. I'm trying to take a practical approach in relation to a set of circumstances that everyone has said can be challenging in terms of enforceability. Um, I believe, on behalf of the society, and I personally believe as well, there could be a statutory defence built into the legislation to say that the driver of the vehicle reasonably believed that the people in the vehicle were all over the age of 18. Um, and be, be able to, under, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, be able to use that as a statutory defence. But if we're looking at ways of being able to set a good example in relation to smoking cessation strategies, there's been some evidence um, more in, in other countries, New Zealand, um, Canada, Ireland, where such legislation has been a little bit more established, to say this is a very effective way of setting, normalising behaviours that people don't smoke in vehicles. So we have to use the resources as effectively as we can. And that, to me, uh, seems the most logical way of doing it. The second point you made, I don't feel I'm even beginning uh, near qualified enough to answer that. So perhaps my... Any other responses to McKenzie's question? Yeah, in terms of the, the enforcement and my sharp-eyed colleagues, uh, again, that would just be down to professional judgment. I mean, I think I think that's what we ask our officers to do. Uh, and every point, one of the things that we train our officers from day one in Police Scotland, uh, as well as our, our ethos around treating everybody with fairness, integrity and respect, is that you have to use your professional judgment and, on occasions, discretion. Um, so whilst uh, we might stop somebody that's smoking um, and they have young children in the car, it isn't necessarily the case that they would always get a ticket. 
And it might well be that part of the enforcement strategy is exactly that, that the police officers um, issue as many warnings as they do tickets. Um, so there's a, there's a whole round way that we, that we can work jointly and, and make this uh, legislation as impactful as, as you wish it to be. That's very reassuring. If, uh, with your indulgence, convener, I'll just come back to Professor Britton, because with the greatest of respect, I don't feel that you really properly uh, you know, answered the question, but perhaps I could rephrase it in a slightly different way. Um, you haven't made the case, I think, for the merits of prosecuting the driver rather than the passenger that's committing the offence. And I'm not clear where the advantage is in prosecuting the poor old driver for vicarious you know, liability rather than just prosecuting the, the passenger that may, may be convicting, con committing the offence. I don't think it's the role of the Law Society to look at issues of prosecuting anyone. Um, in our submission, we were considering the robustness of any possible legislation. The prosecution is not the remit of the Law Society. Um, being able to contribute to effective legislation is um, hopefully within the remit of the Law Society, and that's what we try to do in our submission. The decision on whether to prosecute would lie if the, the vehicle was, was moving with Police Scotland. And my colleague here has already said they would take a practical approach. They have experience already in relation to other road traffic offences, and they would apply that experience. Convener, I can only comment that, yet again, I'm dis disappointed that, you know, the Law Society, as I understand it, have um, suggested that if this legislation goes forward, if this bill's passed, mm -hmm. then it should be the driver that has a, you know, a liability um, under this law uh, rather than the passenger or, or, or a passenger, who, if it's the passenger that's committing the offence. Um, I would re be really pleased if you'd be able to describe why it is you feel that the driver should have this um, legal liability um, you know, and, and not a passenger if it was the passenger that's committing the offence. I, I don't, I don't understand um, what you feel the merits of this argument are. I can only reiterate what I said already, that um, it's first of all a responsibility. We're trying to take a responsibility in relation to protecting young people in a vehicle setting good patterns of behaviour to protect their health and well-being. And on the basis of the Law Society's understanding in relation to issues of enforceability, other jurisdictions have introduced legislation that is before this committee today. And the thing they keep going back to is the challenges in enforceability. And one possible consideration for the committee would be that it may be easier that the responsibility is incumbent on the driver. Is there any other views on whether it should be incumbent on the driver or the, or the person smoking? Uh, Brian? Yeah, um, the, the Institute's response is it's the driver's responsibility. Um, and the most simplistic terms is without the driver, the car can't go anywhere or the vehicle can't move. Um, so they are responsible for those who they are transporting in that vehicle. Um, we understand there may be some situations where the driver may not be able to control the behaviour of individual passengers, but that comes under to what should be considered as a defence to allow someone to smoke in the vehicle. Any other comments? Police Scotland got a view on it, or come on now. <laughs> you know, you, you, could, uh, you could describe the, the cause and permit. You know, so if you're in charge of the vehicle and you cause or permit somebody to commit a, an offence, then you're as liable as the person committing the offence. So, again, not wanting to give you another option, but potentially you could charge both the, the driver and the passenger. There we go. Yeah, I'll take that for a neutral stance. <laughs> yeah. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Very good. <laughs> um, uh, Richard Lyle. Um, I think you sat through the, the session with Mr Clark. Have you not, just all of you, made the case for Mr Clark? We've now got police, council officers, traffic wardens, community officers, the general public, CCTV. And by the way, we're going to set up roadblocks to pull you over. You know, have we not just went from the police who do a good job in checking people for seatbelts, drunk driving, on the phone, 
and, and as they're driving by, you're generally most of your cars have two officers still in them, uh, checking somebody, you know, the, with the, the, the maybe, as I said earlier on, I've got uh, two kids' uh, seats. So you can see my three-year-old uh, grandson, my one-year-old granddaughter sitting in the back. And basically, you know, have we not just made the case for Mr Clark saying, in for me, in for me, you've all got it, in for me. I don't agree with that, Mr Lyle. I think my opening comments, I talked about the number of people that are dying in Scottish roads, mm. and that's a priority for Police Scotland. Now, smoking cigarettes, as we understand it, is not a causal factor for people dying in Scottish roads, but it's a significant health issue. So what we are saying is that in terms of the, the, the benefit to the health of the nation, we absolutely get it and we absolutely support it. But the reality is I'm not going to be setting up roadblocks to check for people smoking in the cars because I need my officers on the fast roads, the big roads, the roads where people are dying and tackling the issues, the issues that, 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 that cause people to die in our roads. And if I can draw a, a very, um, forgive me, crass comparison, um, dog fouling. Dog fouling is a huge concern, huge concern uh, right across every community. They tell us, uh, you know, it's antisocial, <coughs> it's unhealthy. Um, we still have powers um, to deal with dog fouling, but more often than not, it will be the community wardens in that particular area that deal with it. So what I'm saying is that absolutely we've got a role to play in enforcing the legislation, uh, but in terms of the, the impact uh, of our priority to make the roads safer, and reduce the number of people killed, then it won't have a huge impact in that. And as such, we would have to prioritise what action we take to actually reduce the number of people that die in Scottish roads. And I dare say that smoking would not fall into that category. So whilst we would absolutely enforce it, mm -hmm. all I'm suggesting to committee is that you look beyond the role of the police and see who else could assist in that aspect of the legislation Bearing in mind that all colleagues at the table have also said that it can't be done in isolation, it's got to be a collaborative partnership approach, and actually it's got to be in the back of a fairly robust education programme as well. Um, but Professor, I'm, and then Mr Old. I, I would just like to support um, exactly um, what's been said there. One would hope that any form of criminal sanction would be a last resort. It would raise awareness. It would perhaps make people think about whether or not they smoke in a vehicle. It might help them perhaps consider whether or not they would look for other smoking cessation strategies, change their pattern of behaviour, how they wish to enjoy a cigarette. Um, I would be hoping that as one aspect of a whole range of measures, this is something that just raises the profile. The, Statistics are incontestable in relation to the dangers of secondhand smoke. Um, one billion people will die worldwide by 2050. I think these are beyond argument. There are less statistics available in relation to the benefits of having legislation such as what's before us today, but those jurisdictions that do have it are acknowledging that it does start to show an improvement in young people and uh, smoking related disease and setting importantly particularly for teenage years setting a pattern of behavior that these people will not smoke in the future so this should not be something that we rely on as a first point this should be part of a measure um, but something that perhaps just raises that awareness in people's mind to perhaps make other choices themselves and empower them to make choices Mr. Rawls coming back, but I mean, Professor, as legislation, the right, you made an argument, and I think everybody's made an argument of educating and, and campaigns and whatever, whatever. Has the point been made for legislation, I think, is, is the next question. Legislation that is going to be difficult to enforce. Low in the priority to enforce because there's a lot of bigger, you know, and you know, so it's that question, isn't it, about whether this legislation is is necessary to do that, or whether we just do a better job in communicating and educating. I think that's a. Because there are 
from a society's point of view, we believe the legislation is necessary. Okay, Mr Old. I, I would just like to reiterate, Convener, I agree with everything that's been said um, up until now with regards to that. And with respect to Mr Lyle, um, with the examples that you had given about the different enforcement options available, it would be very unlikely all that would be undertaken simply on our resource um, premises. Um, Sorry, I don't mean to show any disrespect with that. Um, enforcement authorities work under many different um, tools. Um, what they want to, to ensure is um, compliance through advice, education, publicity, guidance and a fair and reasonable approach to enforcement. And I do agree, enforcement is regularly regarded um, as the last um, sort of method that you would use to ensure um, compliance. And that was certainly seen through the smoking ban as well. Um, I mentioned earlier on about the number of fixed penalty um, enforcement notices served in Scotland, and it is relatively a short or well, a small number with regards to how long the legislation has been enforced, and that is partly due to the enforcement activities undertaken by regulatory bodies. Enforcement should be seen as the last resort to any form of compliance, um, and that also supports the principles of best regulatory practice. Old. Most of the panel sitting there, witnesses, all said that they could take part in the police can issue tickets, council officers can issue tickets for fouling, dog fouling, for the successful campaign you have in uh, Soccer Hill Street and other places in Glasgow for people throwing down cigarette butts, you can get a ticket, traffic wardens can give you a ticket, community officers you have in Glasgow can give you a ticket. You know, I've just mentioned everybody, but everybody could pick on. And the point that Mr Clark made earlier, and I wasn't supporting him, if you listen quite closely to the point I was putting. I'm a smoker. I believe that this legislation is required. But you've just made the case for Mr Clark that everybody's going to pick on the smokers who sit in their cars. Thank you, Convener. So, uh, the point I was trying to make is you're absolutely right in terms of who can deliver the enforcement activity, but I don't think it would be reasonable to expect that all these activities will, will be undertaken at exactly the same time, because there is just not the resources to do it. So I think it will be up to the local enforcement authority to determine what would be the best course of action to ensure enforcement with the legislation. I think we all understand that most people are law abiding would comply anyway, so it's not context. And the context, you know, the focus on enforcement here today is because of the nature of the panel that we have here today. You know, so you know that, that, that's where it, it, your focus takes us. So um, I've got Bob Doris and, and then and then Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, in the written evidence, we we got some information in relation to whether there was enough clarity in the bill in relation to exemptions for certain vehicles where it was used for human habitation and the the term where it was used not less than than one night, whether that's mobile homes or caravans. I just this would be an opportunity for some of the witnesses maybe to put their their, 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 their own perspective on the record uh, during the evidence session this afternoon. Scotland perspective, I'm quite content with the exemptions as laid out. There's, there's nothing that we'd want to come back on on that point. Okay. Okay. Everyone agree with that on the record, Mr. Old? Yeah, we fully agree with the exemptions as described within um, the bill. I think the, the main area of contention from us was around convertible vehicles. Um, I think there's an argument for <coughs> and against. Um, in terms of the science behind convertible vehicles, um, I think it's still a moving feast when we talk about third-hand tobacco smoke. Um, people think when you're in a convertible car, the cigarette smoke will, will dissipate quite freely, um, but a lot more people drive convertible cars with windows up, so that prevents a barrier, and there's now more evidence coming through about how um, volatile organic compounds, for example, are settling on upholstery and how long they remain there for and how they are getting into into the, the human biological system. So at the present time, um, we would fully support um, removing the convertible vehicles from the, the exemptions and making it more enforceable for those driving convertible vehicles. Everybody, any, any no responses on go to third-hand smoke? I don't think, you know, to, that's a lesson for those who smoke in their car when their grandchildren are not in it. But anyway, we'll leave them pondering on that one. 
Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for that. I've got Dennis Dennis Robertson. Right, you can be. <laughs> Um, he's made me smile today. It's unusual. Um, it, what can I say? Uh, most people are law-abiding. I think we all accept that. Um, earlier on this year, there was a, another piece of legislation came into being which uh, gave powers, uh, not duties, to local authorities um, in terms of uh, the uh, disabled parking, the, the blue badge legislation. And that was brought about because there was a non-compliance by some people in the general public. Are we saying that we need the legislation because the education hasn't worked, so we need to actually have something there to make uh, to try and uh, enforce the, the sensible approach to um, smoking in cars when there's children? Um, because that's what we had to do in terms of the other legislation, because there was a situation that it you know for years we thought the message had got across it, it obviously didn't uh, so we had to bring forward legislation do you see this as a, a similar um, situation maybe please scotland first um i think that's a, a very difficult one for me to answer mr robertson uh, and i'll tell you why uh, again at the risk of of repeating myself um we concentrate on road deaths yeah, and fatalities. Yeah. Um, so, frankly, um, there are child protection, potentially child protection issues with, with smoking in, in vehicles. Mm -hmm. But in terms of actually um, us reducing fatal and seriously injured people on Scottish roads, this mm -hmm. hasn't really featured in their radar. Yeah. And I'm probably talking more to be about park vehicles, and obviously police officers sometimes are obviously on the beat as well. Yeah. And, and that was a situation because before it was only police officers that could enforce that aspect, and now it's been widened uh, to uh, council officers, etc. Uh, and this partnership, collaborative partnership, uh, sounds very sensible to me. And, and I'm just saying that the education in itself doesn't seem to have got the message through. So is this why we require the legislation and this partnership approach? Mr Hamill, thank you. I think that there's, a, there's a, to my mind, a clear correlation between making something illegal uh, and uh, and diminishing it. I mean, we're never going to eliminate this thing, but what will happen is if it becomes known to the public that this is a, a criminal offence, people will correspondingly stop doing it. Not everybody, but the majority of people do it. The seatbelt ban, uh, seatbelt requirement was probably the first obvious case. Of that. Personally, I believe that uh, it's not really a fear of a fear of being caught that's the problem that, that stops people, people or deters people. It's actually the fact that it's now become socially unacceptable. Yeah. So, if you're happy with it, the, the, the impact that um, it will have upon people to that degree, uh, that may just be enough to satisfy us all. But it certainly won't eliminate smoking in cars with children, but it'll probably reduce it quite significantly. And do we give Margaret local, Wallace, sorry, I've just got another one yeah. that's responding to you, Dan. Um, I just think that um, when we're trying to make that big cultural change mm. um, and make people good, responsible citizens and allowing children to have a voice, um, enforcement just becomes the next step to making that cultural change, unfortunately. Um, mm. It would be great if people were responsible and actually we, the education and prevention stuff um, the intervention stuff actually had a had a wider impact, but I think when enforcement's there, people then start to question um, that actually this is enforceable, and it also starts to change that whole cultural element of actually what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Do we give the local authority the powers rather than a duty through this bill? So it means that they can or they cannot. I mean, if they give them the powers, it's up to them as to whether or not they, they obviously go down that road of enforcement or not. The duty, obviously, is a completely different approach and obviously is, is, is more about ensuring that the, the law is, is complied with. Should it be powers or duties? Any response? Yeah, again, Police Scotland's position uh, would support that, Mr Robertson. Again, I don't think uh, the legislation would have the impact um, if we were the sole enforcing agency. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said earlier, it's better to have the ability to do something and yeah. use it rarely than not have the ability to do it at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
else. Okay. Uh, just just on uh, uh, like some um, views on um, the police uh, Scotland's um, submission in regards to. Uh, potential consequences of legislation um, in regard to uh, uh, somebody being found smoking in a car, which would lead to uh, a, a concern that would lead to including the uh, raising of a child concern form, which would be sh shared with the named person uh, under you know under uh, the, the getting a right for every child principles and. Uh, um, Children and Young Persons Scotland Act. Does, it, does everybody agree that that would have that? For it, you know, if somebody's speeding with a child in the car, does it does it does a consequence run that that person was putting that child in danger and a and, and a report and no circumstance in certain circumstances where the road traffic offences we might end up doing that. But the you know the, the purpose within the submission was to highlight this as being because there's obviously the, the public health concern and, and the wider was just to make that issue, you know, just to air that issue to say that actually is the expectation that, you know, as we're finding children who are believed to be in a position of, of, of harm that we'd be looking at these child well being yeah. um concern forms. Um, and that would obviously go to the named person, and that then allows you to then take that into a different sphere in terms of education or intervention with parents through uh -huh. the named person, through schools or whatever. But obviously, there's an implication for local authorities and for the named persons to, to take that work on. Yes. Um, yes. And in terms of repeat offending, how that might continue. Has anyone else thought about that issue, or no? It might be. It might be. It might be useful if um, some of our other witnesses would give that consideration, Professor, <laughs> or indeed the local authorities and any impacts on their responsibilities. I suppose the, the, the other one that was raised about the third party reporting, um, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, given what we've heard in terms of list of priorities, if somebody was reporting on a regular basis when the, 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 the neighbour or the, the guy across the street was taking the kids to school, he was smoking or whatever, whatever, um, would that result in a, an investigation? Would that would, would people act on that third party reporting, Mr. Hamilton? It would come down to this bit about the duty and responsibility. I think that uh, it happens all the time with uh, with pubs. Uh, so uh, we would respond. There's a workplace with somebody smoking. If, mm -hmm. if we just to look at the scenario, if uh, we were advised that a, a neighbour was uh, driving their car regularly with a, a child. <laughs> And I, I would think that it wouldn't be unreasonable for us to approach the individual and warn them, and warn them the fact that uh, this had been observed or reported to us, uh, and that they should be mindful of the fact that uh, they're committing an offence. I can't see us taking formal uh, enforcement action in the back, the back of a third party report. Yes. Mr Higgins. Yeah, very, very similar uh, position. Convener, if you got a third party report, then we would be duty bound to do something with it. Um, I would envisage it would be a simple uh, contact with the, the person um, who allegedly is committing the offence, highlight the fact that it's been brought to their attention and simply asking them not to do it. Um, I do not envisage as, um, fully investigating it in a traditional sense, as in going and taking statements from people and doing scenes of crimes examinations on, on the car. We would have to have an absolutely proportionate and pragmatic response to it, uh, and uh, it just echoes what my colleague has just said there. Mr Old. I completely agree with yes. what's um, been said by my colleagues um, across the table for proactive third, um, sorry, reactive um, third party reporting. What I mentioned earlier on, I, um, and I wasn't sure if you were going to come back to it, was third party proactive reporting, uh -huh. where we perhaps work with the motor industry. So when you are putting your car in for an MOT, um, if there is evidence that there is children being transported in the car and there's evidence of cigarette smoking, for example, there's perhaps an advisory notice given. I'm not suggesting it's then reported to Police Scotland or another authority. Uh -huh. It just comes under this educational approach of advising. Professor. A brief point. Just, we have to remember that the ultimate aim of this bill is to reduce harm and to protect the health of young people. So one would hope that all of the stakeholders involved in taking this legislation forward, if it does go forward, we'd remember that that was the priority there. I think a view should be taken that's very different from running a red light to 
trying to protect the health and well-being of occupants of a vehicle. Yes, I think maybe that's what the police have been saying to us yes. all morning. Yes. <laughs> you know, in yeah. terms of yeah. whether there's a clear role just for the. Yes. We'll take we'll take all of, all of that away and, and consider. There's one final question, just uh, following on from Bob Doris' question about the uh, the, the question of um, human habitation and uh, not less than one night, you know. And and again, you're here we're talking about enforcement. How how would something like that? Everybody was supportive of it, but how would something like not less than one night be enforced? That <laughs> it's a, a very difficult one, convener. Um, it would it would really, I mean, if it was on a campsite, for example, you know, you would be able to see when the when the camper van arrived in the campsite, and you know how long they're they're, they're tethered there. Um, you know, if it's in a, a cab of a lorry that's parked up overnight in a, a, a lorry park, you know. So again, it just goes down to um, assessing what you see in front of you at that particular time and applying a, a pragmatic, uh, common-sense approach. Although, speaking out loud there, if I've got a child in the back of a lorry camping overnight, then <laughs> there, might, there might be wider yeah, issues no, no, than no, just no, simply no, smoking. No, no. But <laughs> um, I was trying desperately to think of an example there. But it would be uh, simply um, assessing the circumstances as you see in front of it um, and taking a pragmatic, common-sense approach. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Old? I think it's just to add to the point that it's it's for people's home, so motorhomes, for example, and it's not for those that are maybe being rented, for example, camper vans and travelling around, because they're already covered under the, the smoking ban for um, for such vehicles. Right. OK, thanks for that. Is there any other... Excuse me, I nearly stretched these there, I'm sorry about that. Uh, is there any other questions from the committee members? Can I thank you all very much for being with us this morning, the written evidence you've provided um, uh, and the good evidence you've provided to us orally today. Thank you all very much for your, your time and evidence. Thank you. The, uh, yeah, we just close. There's nothing else there, is there? Well, we'll close the meeting at that point. Thank you all for your patience and participation. <laughs>